I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the first of the backbench business <laughs> debates. So we now come to the backbench debate on the loan charge, and I call Sammy Wilson to move. I told him. And can I, first of all, uh, before we start this debate, on behalf of my own party, um, pass on our condolences to the family of Tony Lloyd, who served, of course, for a short time as the Shadow Minister for Northern Ireland. I always found him very, very courteous well-informed, wanted to be well-informed, asked the right questions, and I was always prepared to engage, even though he very often didn't agree with some of the stance that we took, always um, happy to engage with all the parties in Northern Ireland. And we do pass on our condolences to his family. Um, uh, I'm concerned that... Gentlemen might. Ah, that's better. <laughs> OK, let's start again. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I hope that um, the point that I was making about uh, Tony Lloyd uh, was picked up. Um, I want to pass on the, the, the um, views of our party and condolences to his family and for the work that he did as Shadow Minister for Northern Ireland. And I thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting this debate. I believe it's a very timely debate, and, and uh, it's one which I know that many thousands of people mm -hmm. across the United Kingdom who have been affected by the loan charge in a very detrimental way will be glad to see being considered here in this House. Yeah, yeah. Over the last two weeks, we have been uh, looking at the fallout, the dramatic fallout of the Horizon scandal in the post office. And quite rightly, we have been focusing on what belatedly can be done to repay and to deal with that great injustice. Could I say to this House, and I don't think I'm being over dramatic when I say this, we are looking at another Horizon scandal yeah. as we look at this, uh, and the parallels are frightening. First of all, because of actions of a government department, we have had 10 people in the United Kingdom who have committed suicide and many others who, because of the pressure they have put under by officials and by statutes which have been passed through this parliament, have attempted to take their own lives. As well, of course, as we have heard in, in evidence time and time again in the All Party Group, the disruption and disaster which it has caused in many families. Yeah, yeah. The second thing is this, that despite the fact that these alarm bells should be ringing in the, 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 the Treasury, no action has been taken. Indeed, ministers, some ministers have even refused to meet the group. Others have simply put out the party line and regurgitated the HMRC excuses mm -hmm. for what is, is happening. And, 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 well, yeah. Does he also agree that it seems to be yet again a case where actually people acting in good faith are being prosecuted and pursued, whereas actually the people who absolutely knew what they were doing are getting away scot-free? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a point that I want to come to. But you know, we, we, we are seeing that once again ministers are turning a blind eye. And the lesson should be learnt. Because apart from two examples that I can think of as ministers, one of whom, former minister, is present in the, the, the House um, t -t today, um, ministers turned a blind eye for years. And then we had the, the, the result, and it wasn't until an ITV programme brought this matter to the nation as a whole that action was taken. We also have attempts by HMRC to justify what they've been doing. In the past, they accused postmasters and postmistresses who had been had 
unblemished records for years as being thieves. Now we are being told that the people who are involved and the people who HMRC are chasing today are, to use the words, serial tax evaders. And Minister, I've got to say, um, when when I read the the letter which you had... um, the Honourable Gentleman knows he doesn't address the Minister direct through, through the Chair. And, and, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, when I read the letter which the Minister has sent to um, the, uh, the Joint Chairs of the, the Committee, where he started off by once again reminding us, as you are aware, disguised remuneration schemes are contrived tax avoidance arrangements. Um, that seek to avoid income and national insurance contributions. It's almost like a warning. Don't be taking up these cases, because these are bad people that you're talking about. And this is exactly the same parallel as we found with the Horizon scandal. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you. I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman, uh, and can I say that I agree with uh, how he has uh, introduced this debate. But there's, he's mentioned this issue of the uh, scale of how they're going after people who are caught up with the loan charge. It's stark contrast, isn't it, to multinational companies who are entering into sweetheart <coughs> deals with yeah. HMRC like Google and Vodafone. Mm-hmm. Indeed it is. And I want to come to the, the issue of uh, chasing the individuals rather than the promoters. It's, uh, well, let me just make this point. Um, because it seems that HMRC are going after the, those who they regard as easy targets. Yeah. Yeah. The promoters of the scheme, not one penny, despite the promoters have made hundreds of millions of pounds from these schemes, have missold the schemes, have disappeared when they, there are any attempts to get at them. That those promoters are not being pursued. And indeed, HMRC has already admitted that they do not intend to chase after the promoters. And yet, individuals are being harassed, yeah. uh, harassed to the point where um, many of them have taken their own lives. I'll give away that. The Honourable Member for East Antrim for having secured today's debate, especially given that at least 10 people have sadly committed suicide. It is, of course, essential that disguised remuneration screams are dealt with fairly and effectively. But why does the uh, Honourable Member think that the Government and HMRC have actively pursued the architects and promoters of the scheme rather than those who themselves have been a victim uh, of uh, uh, being led into the scheme? Well, I think the answer is very easy. The victims are easy targets. They're the ones who are easy to chase. The promoters of the schemes um, have, first of all, got all kinds of means of defence. Many of them have disappeared when they realise that they may well be pursued. And indeed, it seems that even today, and this is the, the baffling thing, and maybe the Minister can explain it, If these um, schemes are designed as contrived ways of avoiding tax, why is HMRC not pursuing even some of the new promoters who are establishing themselves today and will have disappeared by tomorrow once it is seen that their schemes are being challenged? I'll give away, yes. I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman for his courtesy on this occasion, and I share his comments about Sir Tony Lloyd as a member of the committee of the committee that I serve as chair on. He makes a very important point about the regulation as well of promoters. Where is the regulation of these individuals? This is an ungoverned space. Surely they are trying to sell financial services products and should at least come under the control of the FCA. We've really got to not just focus upon what's happened in the past, but look at what is happening now where innocent people are being exploited. And, and I, I do intend to come on to that point. But the parallels, as I say, are frightening. And I ask myself the question, and ministers should be asking themselves the question as well. In one, two, four, five, ten years' time, are, they, are we going to find the same embarrassment? And ministers who parroted the department's line being asked the question, why did you uh, not... 
raise the alarm at the time? Why, did, why were, the, why were the, the explanations not challenged? And why were, were the, the, the calls for help not heeded? And I think that uh, that should be a salutary warning to the two um, ministers. Uh, for giving way, and it's very unusual that I agree with every word um, <laughs> he's, actually, he's actually said thus far. But it, I'm being generous, um, but, but uh, when he's, he's, making that, he's, make, he's making that point, yes, I do apologise, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, but the, the simple truth is that HMRC failed to, failed to police this issue, and many people actually made HMRC aware of, these, of their involvement in these schemes, and it took HMRC years, years to get back to them to even to look into the issue. That's, a, that's a, one of the real crimes about this. Yeah. I'm glad that the member does agree with everything I've said today, and I think he's, e he's even dressed to show that agreement today with his red, white and blue outfit, and I appreciate that very, very much. Maybe he's become a unionist as well, which is, even for a day, would be a, 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 something unbearable. <laughs> let's just look at the role of the H HMRC in this and the approach which they have taken. Because it has been quite rightly pointed out that there should have been, within HMRC, much more supervision of what was going on. It was quite clear, um, and I mean, the, the HMRC are now saying, that they believed that many of the people who used payroll loan schemes should have actually been paying PAYE. But at the time, HMRC we're not challenging these schemes. In fact, the promoters were able to say they're legitimate. For years, people were acting on the fact that they were, were legitimate and <coughs> were, were, were no risk. Here's the ultimate irony, of course, that HMRC employed people on contracts <laughs> to do work for them. Oh, yes, yes. knowing that these people were being paid in this way mm -hmm. and never challenged it. And of course, that being the case, we've got to ask what level of supervision was or did HMRC change their mind and then, having changed their mind, decide to go after the individuals who had um, undertaken these schemes? Now, some people will argue, well, it's their own fault. After all, they knew that um, when they introduced, uh, in, in, went into one of these schemes, their, their tax liability may have been reduced. So if people did that, they took the risk. The fact was, of course, many people did not volunteer to go into these schemes. Yeah. Many people were forced into these schemes. Mm -hmm. Some people were put into the schemes and didn't even know they were in them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. As far as they were concerned, they were employed by a contractor mm -hmm. The contractor was that their tax was being deducted, and they later on found out, of course, that that wasn't the case. Yeah. And by the way, this was not rich people employing fancy accountants nope. to tell them how to avoid their tax. Mm -hmm. Many of the people who were caught up in this were ordinary workers, yep. nurses, teachers, cleaners. And of course, uh, some people who were wanting to set up a company, and because of the flaws in the IR35, this was the only way of um, uh, uh, dealing with their tax affairs. So people were not always volunteering to go into this. In fact, in fact we did have, and this is how we discovered HMR, and one of the ways we discovered HMRC were involved in this, we did have one lady who came to us and said, I was employed for IT consultancy. The contractor was working for HMRC. The only way in which I could get the job was to be paid through one of these schemes. I didn't particularly want to, but I wanted the work, so I had to go and, and enter into the scheme. And the HMRC apparently were quite happy for that contractor to pay their workers in that, in, 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 uh, that manner. So people were, in many cases, forced, if they wanted to work, forced into these kinds of schemes. And for years, although the, the, it was quite clear there was an employer-employee relationship, they were under um, the direction and supervision of the, the, a, a company, yet they were treated as if they were separate, standalone employees um, or uh, individuals, self-employed people who could pay tax um, in this uh, particular way. And 
the result was, of course, then when it was decided that these schemes were not tax compliant and there were years and years of back tax, we had ministers persuaded in 2017 Finance Act to introduce the loan charge and of course it was very convenient for HMRC to have this arrangement in place because using the loan charge enabled HMRC to decide what tax an individual was liable for. They couldn't challenge it in the normal way in which tax disputes can be dealt with either through tribunals or courts. That was ruled out to them and in many instances the HMRC didn't, HMRC didn't even have to explain where, how the tax bill was reached. And of course, if you don't have any redress to the court or the tribunal, you really don't have any chance of negotiating Nothing. whether or not the tax which you were, are, are, are being deemed liable for is, is um, a liability and a correct liability. Added to this, of course, was the fact that many employers saw this as an advantage Absolutely. because they could employ people without paying the, paying the employment taxes. Yeah. They didn't have to uh, deal with pensions. They didn't have to deal with holiday pay. Mm -hmm. And that's why many employers forced individuals to be paid mm -hmm. in this way. Yeah. So those who say and those who argue that, look, these people tried to avoid paying tax and slap it up them now they've found it got reached the consequences and they should just grin and bear it. Let's bear that in mind that there are thousands of people who are affected by this and who are affected by this because they were impotent to stop this method of payment being used and they were told by tax uh, by the promoters that it was all compliant, there was no risk. In fact, 93% of those who were in these schemes were assured there was no risk. And that they were compliant. And indeed, here's the, the thing. They probably were compliant until in later years, HMRC decided they weren't compliant. So people are left with tax investigations back to 2010, which have resulted in uh, many of them finding that they're, it's impossible to pay. In fact, and we're, and I just want to mention a couple of case studies um, in a moment or two. Um, the confusion, the confusion uh, that there is in HMRC made it very difficult for people to settle. Because HMRC didn't, it seems, have the capacity to tell people. Mm. And indeed, in one particular case, uh, the, the individual was told, after six years, you owe £91,000. So he wanted to settle rather than be put in the loan charge. He was told, despite that this wasn't criteria, we don't believe you could afford to pay £91,000 on the terms that you've, you, you've um, given. So no settlement was granted. Put in the loan charge and the man who couldn't afford to pay £91,000 was then hit with a bill of £124,000. So he couldn't afford to pay £91,000 in a settlement, but he was pushed into loan charge where he's going to pay uh, £124,000. Uh, and this, it's, it's this, first of all, the, the back charges, the fact that tax years which people thought were closed have been reopened, yep. the confusion, some people now being asked to pay more in tax than what they actually earned because the, the HMRC actually do estimates. I think one person was told when uh, an explanation was sought as to how much, uh, why do I owe this much, as because everybody else paid that amount. Um, and of course, no redress. Let me um, just. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I thank the Honourable Member for, for giving way and congratulating her on bringing this such important debate uh, to, to the Chamber. I have been contacted by several constituents of mine in West Lancashire um, who have described themselves as victims 
um, of this. Um, and would he agree with me that those people who are being asked to pay what my constituents describe as um, yeah, incomprehensible amounts of money, whereas their employers and the people that provided those schemes are not being pursued for one penny, are victims but are being assumed criminals. Is, would he agree with me that they must be treated as victims and that this must be covered by a truly independent Sammy inquiry? Sammy Wilson. Um, that brings me to the very last point. I promise, uh, Madam, uh, <laughs> I will simply list the points. Other people can take them up and expand them later on. There are a number of issues which I think the Minister must consider. The first is this, and I have no evidence of it, but we have been told that HMRC officials, just as post office officials were, are on commission for the money which they, uh, they bring in yep. through the loan charge. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Minister yeah. has to confirm, is that the case? Because, of course, that's a huge incentive yeah, for people to uh, then pursue so individuals relentlessly. The second thing is, I trust that the, the Minister, in his new position, will challenge the department's lines on this. Yep. We need a greater challenge than what we have had in the past. The third thing is, I believe that the loan charge needs to be repealed because it's seen that it's not fit for purpose, and indeed it's having detrimental effect. The fourth thing is that the employers and the promoters must be pursued. Yeah, yeah. Under, yeah. Law, yeah. If, under law, if they were employers, then they ought to have been responsible for the tax Absolutely. and collecting the tax um, mm -hmm. from the uh, employees. Yeah. And that's the basis on which people are now being, uh, having tax demands made on them, that they were actually employees and not um, uh, self-employed. Uh, the, the, the next thing is that, of course, we recognise that government has <coughs> to collect tax if it's due. But since the current method of pursuing this is not going to um, bring the, the tax revenue forward because people are going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Surely the proposal which has been put forward by um, a, a, a group of professionals that the government claim back a, a proportion of the tax which they claim is owed um, and a, an affordable proportion and at least get some tax revenue out of it and stop this relentless pursuit of individuals. In the longer run, of course, I think we do need a Bill of Rights for taxpayers, and we need to have tax fairness built into uh, legislation. But that's uh, for, uh, for a longer debate uh, in this House. I just appeal to the Minister. There are people who are suffering today as they're being battered by the cost which HMRC officials are using on them to try and extract money from them which they don't have and which many of them don't believe they owe to HMRC. And I would ask the Minister to grasp this nettle and to ensure that we don't have another horizon scandal on it. Yeah. 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 The question is, as on the order paper, um, as colleagues can see, this is a very well subscribed debate. We've got another debate following, um, and in order to um, give equal time to backbenchers across the whole of the afternoon, my advice, because I'd rather not put a time limit on, is that um, if colleagues can stick to about seven minutes, that would be equal for everyone, which Greg Smith, I'm sure, will lead the way on. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, thank you. And can I start by congratulating my honourable friend for East Antrim uh, for not only securing this debate, but the incredible, powerful and eloquent way uh, that he has opened it, a speech uh, that I entirely endorse. Indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker, I serve alongside my rightable friend uh, and the noble Baroness Kramer in the other place as co-chairman of the all-party parliamentary group uh, on the loan charge and taxpayer fairness. And it is through that lens and the very many constituents who have come to me who are victims uh, of the loan charge that has led, to me pre led me to be profoundly troubled by what I can only describe as one of the most significant crises faced by British taxpayers, uh, certainly in my living memory. The loan charge has and is still haunting thousands of our constituents across uh, the whole country, bringing with it a train of despair and destruction uh, that should weigh heavily upon HMRC uh, and indeed all of us in this House. To date, there have been an estimated 60,000 people affected by the loan charge. And tragically, as has already been referenced in this debate, 
10 of those people have come to the tragic conclusion of ending their own lives. I invite the House to reflect upon a policy of HMRC that has led to 10 people in this country. I pray no more who have ended their own lives because of it, because of a retrospective tax policy. Those are not numbers on a page, Madam Deputy Speaker. They are human tragedies, each one a poignant reminder of the injustices felt by individuals still grappling with the devastating consequences of the sorts of amounts of money that my right honourable friend referenced being asked of them in cases more than they ever actually earned in the first place. The profound impact of the loan charge extends its reach far beyond mere statistics, financial repercussions. It is a devastating narrative that encompasses contractors, freelancers, agency workers from all walks of life. Professionals seeking compliance under IR35 legislation. They took and followed professional guidance in good faith. The Honourable Member for uh, giving way. Uh, on the point of the taking advice and uh, being uh, led by agencies and promoters, does the Honourable mem Member agree with me that it is simply uh, scandalous that none of these agencies have been pursued uh, by HMRC for their part in this? And does he also agree that that further heightens the injustice felt by those who are being pursued? That intervention, I think that is a point that we can have consensus on. It is outrageous that the promoters have not been uh, pursued. It is a point that the all-party parliamentary group has considered and looked at and taken evidence on, uh, and it's certainly something I will continue to push in this debate uh, and for the weeks and months and years ahead in trying to get justice for all the victims uh, of the loan charge and to hold those uh, that gave that advice, who knew what they were doing, I suggest, uh, to, to bring them uh, to account. And, and for uh, my honourable member for securing this debate, uh, would he agree with me that there should never be an instance where protecting the coffers of the state should take precedence over protecting the lives of our constituents? Yeah. My, my honourable friend makes an incredibly powerful point. I agree with him <coughs> entirely. And part of the ask of this debate, part of the ask of the all party parliamentary group on the loan charge and taxpayer fairness is to get to a fair settlement, a settlement that people can actually afford to pay, a settlement that takes into account, dare I say it, reality, that understands what people actually are, that understands that they acted in good faith, that they took the professional advice that I was talking about a few moments ago. I, I, I will give away one more time. Very generous. And is that not the case that what we really need is proper transparency of government bodies and how they operate? Because that's really what is undermining the trust um, in government at all um, of so many people if they see this again and again. We need transparency. The Honourable Lady, I'm grateful for her intervention. I, I agree with that, that we, of course we need transparency. We need transparency across all walks of life, government or otherwise. I think uh, to to bring it back to the reference uh, my honourable friend Fries Antrim made about the Horizon scandal in the post office, the clear similarity here, though, that I think there does need to be an inquiry and there does need to be serious action taken on, is how you can have bodies, in the case of the Horizon scandal, the post office, in the case of the loan charge scandal, HMRC, where a body of the state is autonomous in being judge, jury and executioner at the same time, that is something that we simply have to take away, uh, and there have to be the checks and balances built into HMRC <coughs> if we are to see justice for the loan charge victims, uh, as well as any other uh, crisis, any other scandal that might well uh, come about in the future. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am, I am mindful of the time limit uh, you have set, and there is m much more that I could say on this, this subject. What I want to see, uh, what I urge my honourable friend, uh, the Minister, whose letter yesterday offering a meeting with the All-Party Parliamentary Group I am incredibly grateful for, and I hope we can 
get that meeting in the diary as soon as is humanly possible so we can have this meaningful dialogue on how we get to a settlement, on how we get a review into HMRC practices, how we get justice uh, for the loan charge victims, because I suspect uh, from seeing some of the colleagues, certainly on this side of the House, uh, bobbing as well, we are going to get many more powerful stories and testimony from victims of the loan charge, whose lives we should see as totally valuable and totally uh, deserving uh, of our attention and justice going into the future. Gerald Jones. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in, in today's debate and congratulate the Honourable Member for East Antrim uh, for securing the debate and also to the Backbench uh, Business Committee for, for granting the debate. And I declare my uh, membership of the Long Charge uh, All Party Group. As we've heard, the issue is long standing and it continues to have uh, an impact on the health and well-being of thousands of people right across the country, including residents in Merthyr Tydfil and Rumney. This includes my constituent, Geraint Owen, who I've met with on a number of occasions uh, over a long time. Mr Owen and other victims uh, of the, this scandal it, it experienced considerable frustration uh, attempting to deal with uh, HMRC, and the way HMRC have dealt with the issue has caused unbelievable uh, hardship, distress and anxiety for large numbers of the people uh, that we serve. This uh, sorry saga, as we've heard a number of times already, has striking similarities with the Post Office uh, Horizon scandal that we've heard so much uh, about in recent weeks. Ordinary people up and down the country have been asked for unrealistic payments uh, and this is causing huge uh, financial hardship, bankruptcy uh, and worse, including people at risk of losing homes uh, and increased suicide. There are real concerns that this is another scandal uh, where the government has ignored the alarm bells and cries for help. So I urge the government to revisit uh, and to ensure a fairer and more effective approach. This is a huge opportunity to raise the whole injustice of the loan charge scandal. At a recent meeting of the all-party group, we heard uh, more harrowing stories about how people's lives have has been ripped apart by the, the loan charge. The government's approach to the loan charge uh, has meant that ordinary people who are the victims of Miss Sellen are facing, as I've said, huge bills that are causing untold uh, distress and personal harm. The numbers of suicides linked to this issue has tragic, uh, tragically reached uh, double figures. Clearly, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, Labour supports attempts to, to tackle tax avoidance schemes, but that's not what we're talking about. It is clear from some of the accounts reported, including those we heard at meetings of the all-party group, that there have been so many shocking uh, accounts of harm and distress that people liable to the loan, loan charge have, have suffered, that it demonstrates how the government's approach has gone badly wrong. We on this side have consistently called for a fair and effective approach from HMRC uh, instead of the current approach, which is ex extremely tough on those caught up in it. And we are clear that the 2019 Morse review cannot be the final word uh, on this matter. Our amendment tabled to the 2020 Finance Act that would have forced the government to review the impact of the scheme, including the fairness with which uh, HMRC has implemented the policy and a proposed new clause to the Finance Act 2022 uh, would have required the Chancellor to commission an independent review to consider HMRC's approach to the loan charge scheme and make recommendations on how it should be altered and would have also required the Government to explain to the House of Commons what efforts it had taken to guarantee the review's independence. We need a fair and effective approach from HMRC instead of the current approach, which is ex extremely tough on those caught up, but weaker on the architects of it. As the Loan Charge All Party Group has previously suggested, the tax burden should not fall solely on individual users of the schemes, but also on the employers and agencies, and also, ideally and appropriately, the operators, promoters of the schemes. On this basis, the government should change course and announce a fairer approach. We must remember, Madam Deputy Speaker, the human impact of the loan charge. As we know, and as I touched on earlier, HMRC have confirmed that there have been 10 suicides of people facing the loan charge, and now uh, I've also confirmed that they have referred 13 suicide attempts. This in itself should be enough reason to stop this cruel retrospective policy. So I urge the government to accept that there is something deeply wrong uh, with the current approach on the scheme. 
Reports to the Treasury Select Committee last October stated that around 40,000 people still face the loan charge. This, this means that four and a half years on from the loan charge, there's this still many unresolved cases. It hasn't worked. HMRC still have tens of thousands of cases uh, that they're trying to resolve, and 10 families have lost loved ones to suicides. The whole sorry saga is cruel and unacceptable and needs action now. So in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, the government must think again when ordinary people who are victims of mis-selling face financial ruin and personal harm because of the way the loan charge has been pursued. And this must be done urgently. And I hope that the uh, Minister today will address this in summing up uh, today's debate. Thank you. So Ian Duncan-Smith. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm going to try not to repeat everything that's said, but it is very difficult not to. I just want to start by saying the one thing I discovered in government and I have constantly watched, which is relevant to this, is that HMRC are a very peculiar department yeah. because they are unaccountable. Yeah. They're the only department that does not publish any accounts every year, so there is no scrutiny of monies lost or monies failed to be gained. And they act independently with many of those who are civil servants going on radio and television, uh, not reliant on ministers to take the responsibility for them. This has been one of the biggest problems in all of this. The backdrop to this is they operate almost with impunity, and I've seen ministers come and go uh, at the dispatch box who are told one thing by HMRC, leave that position, come back and say, I didn't know half of the stuff that was going on. So I simply say there is a problem with HMRC. I give way to the other. Right Honourable Member for uh, giving way. Uh, campaigners have often asked, uh, given the, the, uh, the, the way that the HMRC work, com campaigners have often asked to see draft documents that are hidden to them. They're not able to see, for example, the draft of the report. Does he agree with me that in light of the, her the Post Office Horizon Fujitsu scandal, one of the things that was really evident there was that holding back that information was detrimental to justice. Does he agree with me that information should be available wherever it is practical to do so? Of course, absolutely. Um, and I come back to the point I was just making. I mean, no insult to the civil servants who work very hard, etc. It's just simply the culture of HMRC is one of impunity. Uh, and they don't behave like many other departments. We have problems with other government departments, and I ran one, I know what that's all about. But ultimately, HMRC act in a very different way from other government departments, and that is protected uh, ultimately by the Treasury. And I think that is where one of the biggest problems arises, and that's why it's so difficult to get any information out of them, because even the ministers who are in charge of them simply do not and seem not unable to be able to command or direct them to do just that. And I simply make that observation from working, and I give away. I didn't mean to go through time. He's making a, I'm very grateful to him. He's making a very powerful point about HMRC. It was brought together as a force merger of Inland Revenue and Her Majesty's Re uh, Customs uh, by, I, I think it was uh, Gordon Brown and, and the Labour government, and really it was rushed and pushed together. And it's never properly enjoyed the sort of scrutiny and ministerial involvement that, frankly, it should have. Would you agree with me that, frankly, now is a time for a root and branch review and a change to the nature of HMRC, retaining its independent functions, of course, but allowing for greater ministerial oversight? <clears throat> I agree. I didn't intend for this to head off down this track, but I will observe one thing. The thing that evidences is very clear, that it's now become clear that HMRC has been unable to find any legal basis to justify their claim that they have to pursue individuals, but not those who promoted the schemes. That is now clear, and they have protected and tried to deny that for some time, but that's become very clear. Even the head uh, uh, of, uh, of this particular body uh, the Permanent Secretary of the Interest stated, in recent months I have repeatedly tried to obtain legal analysis to understand the strength of our claim uh, with very little success. For yesterday's hearing, we were initially given the summary of avoidance wins, some of which has nothing to do with the scheme. So I simply say they still can't justify the legal basis for pursuing individuals rather than going, and not going after those who promoted the scheme. Mm. Well, I'm uh, conscious of timing, so I wonder if you'll... For Forgive me, I think others have got to speak, and I'm going to try and stick to the Deputy Speaker's prescription. So I apologise to my right honourable and uh, friend. Um, I just want to raise three uh, uh, individuals, constituents of mine, uh, and very quickly. One is Gareth Lloyd, Joe Green, and Karen Dubery. All three have been facing terrible impositions now on them, and I'm sure uh, many colleagues in the House will have the same. Gareth Lloyd said, face, uh, facing and now paying the loan charge has meant years of stress. The constant stream of demands and letters from HRC, HMRC 
when I should have been enjoying watching my young family grow up. I'm fearful constantly of losing my home. Joe Green says nine years of worry, nine years of anxiety, nine years of not knowing what to expect from HMRC other than continual bullying tactics to try and extort monies from me uh, that are out with threats. Karen Dubry shocked and alarmed when I learned of the loan charge. I felt alone, scared, threatened and worried for me and my family. The mental stress on me and my family has been immense. Now, we know this because we've seen at the far extreme of that uh, uh, people committing suicide. But there are many other problems between that uh, of those that are. And I simply say to all of them, they deserve a better process, uh, a, more, a fairer process, and a process that is open and reasonable and goes after those who originally promoted these for they were under the uh, impression, as was the case, that they were quite legal. And the more important thing was HMRC conjured up a retrospective process yeah, to this, which has yeah, yeah. historically been appalling and never brought about. You, know, you have to deal with where you were at the beginning. And that was to get off the fact that somehow they felt that they had lost a whole load of taxation, but they didn't want to blame themselves. What they did was go after those individuals, threaten them, and cajole them. And I don't think that the um, uh, issue of the uh, inquiry that took place, the Morse Review, now it turns out did not appear to be that independent. Uh, I gave some evidence, as many did, to that original inquiry, and I assumed at the beginning that it was completely independent. In fact, it turns out that it wasn't, and HMRC got to see uh, elements of that report before it was even published, which was astonishing uh, to me, as we were given clear understanding that it was to be independent. So there is much more that needs to be done, and that review is by no means the end of it. And I'm I'm, I was surprised when uh, my honourable friend, the member for Hereford and South Herefordshire, who was the minister at the time, uh, who then came on to say that we have plans underway to crack down further on the promoters of those avoidance schemes. It turns out they don't. Uh, so why is a minister allowed to go to the dispatch box to make a statement uh, w w by civil servants who then find out that it's not right? Right, he's not. They're going after the individuals, not those who promoted it. And as we discover, they don't have any legal basis for that, so the whole thing's become a terrible mess. I congratulate uh, those who brought this debate forward because there's so much more here that needs to be said. And I just simply want to get to the process of concluding on all of this, uh, that uh, this has been going on for so, so long. Laws change retrospectively, denials about what they were doing, bullying, uh, intimidation, uh, uh, and, and a failure to come clean about the processes that were engaged in all of this. This is so, so familiar. We're just in the middle of it, as our honourable friend said previously, uh, that there was a problem over the post office. And all of this was the process that we saw, the denials, the protections, uh, the pretenses, all happened. And we've been seeing it with the loan charge for a long, long time. And it's very clear now, and I hope the Minister will recognise this, that this is long past a point where we need to start recognising that this is not the way for any government department to behave when it's treating an issue like this which has clearly created a huge problem. My constituents, many other constituents, have faced this issue. Uh, they should not be pursued in the way that treats them as start as a criminal, but rather as somebody who is involved in something that at the time HMRC never said was yeah. illegal, and now they've pretended that it is. And I simply say, I hope the government will now recognise we don't want to see a repeat of what happened with the post office scandal mm -hmm. here with the result of HMRC's bad behaviour. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to start by thanking the Honourable Member for East Antrim for securing this important debate and also to acknowledge the many thousands around the country affected by the loan charge. I know some of them are in the gallery today including some of my own constituents, and I'd like to pay tribute to their dignity and determination in pursuing their cause. I'd like to focus first and foremost on the fundamental unfairness of the loan charge, but also, as has previously been mentioned, about the Morse review and the need for greater transparency. I've been contacted by a number of people whose lives have been turned upside down by the charge, Whilst it's not possible for me to give voice to all of them here today, I'd like to share one story which I think speaks to the experience of many. They said, I've been forced to raise, raise huge sums, including borrowing from my mother and by borrowing huge sums against my home, leaving me in a position where I cannot plan for my own or my family's future. The impact on my mental and physical health and my relationships has been huge 
and I am in genuine fear for my future well-being if HMRC is allowed to continue unencumbered. Another con constituent told me in great distress how she made the difficult decision to have an abortion based on concerns about affordability stemming from the loan charge. Combined with the number of suicides which have taken place, this paints a truly harrowing picture of the impact this unfair charge is having. If I may turn to the Morse Review, the report by the Loan Charge APPG published in 2020 found direct interference, as, as has been mentioned, by both the Treasury and HMRC in the review, and that both organisations made clear attempts to direct the review from the outset. Given the tragic impact of the charge and the public interest in this matter, surely it is time for the government to set up a genuinely independent review that achieves a fair and final resolution for all. I would like to end by raising one final point about the need for greater transparency. Late last year, one of my constituents was successful in overturning the Information Commissioner's decision to allow the Treasury not to release the final draft of the loan charge review. That original FOI was made in December 2020, and yet over three years later, the material has still not been released. This constituent tells me their attempts to obtain the, the documentation have been met with what they consider to be deliberate attempts to avoid FOI obligations, including being told by the Treasury that the information has been destroyed, then that it could not be found, and eventually that it was prohibitively expensive to locate it. This lack of transparency undermines trust in our institutions and must be addressed. I hope the Minister can give me their assurance that they will look into this particular matter and take all reasonable steps to ensure the information is released as soon as possible. Madam Deputy Speaker, with over 50,000 people directly impacted and the tragic death of 10 people, it is vital that we do everything we can to find a fair and final resolution to the loan charge scandal. To gain public trust, far greater transparency from HMRC and the Treasury is needed. Most importantly, we need a new, genuinely independent review to take place. Sir so Desmond Sway. Madam Deputy Speaker, if, as ministers insist, the law was clear in 2010, then it would have been entirely unnecessary to have the 2017 legislation open up tax years because my constituents who've been affected by this mis-selling mis scandal, for that is what it is, my constituents made their tax arrangements entirely clear in those years and were unchallenged by HMRC within the proper windows available. So it's entirely unnecessary. And the reality is this, that the vendetta that HMRC is now pursuing, notwithstanding the obf obfuscation of written parliamentary, parliamentary answers, the vendetta is being exclusively pursued against the victims of that mis-selling scandal. So happy are those members of this parliament who were not here in 2017 and did not vote in favour of the Finance Number no. 2 Bill 2017 that contained the measure that is now torturing so many of our constituents. We are culpable for not having spotted, not having asked, not having uh, examined the consequences and implications of the measure that was brought before us, a measure that cries foul against every tenant of proper legislation. One, its retrospective aspect. Two, that it takes away from our constituents the right to appeal to a tribunal, an administrative or a quasi-judicial process to have their case fairly considered. It puts HMRC as both judge and jury in their case. And what a judge and jury they have turned out to be. And so we now come 
to another of these debates where we recount the latest injustices, we enumerate the rising tally of suicides, and the minister, in all probability, will make the same speech as his predecessor made the last time. And I ask our all members, what is the point? Well, the point is this, as I see it. It affords a recurring opportunity for honourable members to recant from what the House did when it created this injustice. Drip by drip, member by member, the tally will increase and ultimately it will reach the public consciousness. Now, the Honourable Member for Kingston and Surbiton, who has served this all-party group and to whom we are indebted for his chairmanship when he was in the chair of this group. He has been hounded over the last few weeks and found himself in a very unfortunate position for being the postal minister at the height of the Horizon scandal, notwithstanding the fact that he was lied to on an industrial scale. But nevertheless, it's been very uncomfortable for him to have the charge that he didn't ask the right questions, he didn't pursue it enough, and he didn't spend time with the victims. Let that be an object lesson to us and to all those ministers who stood at the dispatch box giving us flannel and peddling the fiction that the limited inquiry was in some way independent. So my advice to my honourable friend today is this. Set aside the brief that you've begin, begin given End this debate by just saying, you've sat here, you've heard what we've said, and you're going to go away and ask the awkward questions and spend time with the victims. Because ultimately, this will reach the public consciousness. We may even have our own TV drama. The reality is there's plenty, plenty of scope for such a drama. And when it does reach the forefront of public consciousness, we will rue the day that we didn't take the action when we could. John, <clears throat> John McNally, yeah, please. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. That was a phenomenally good speech. And I do congratulate the Honourable Member for East Andrum on securing this debate today and for the, the powerful and the passion that you, your speech was, it was very, very impressive. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd also first of all like to thank the APPG Loan Charge and Taxpayer Fairness for uh, the work that they've put into this and also to the Loan Charge Action Group for their diligence and work on this very serious issue and indeed to my own constituents who have suffered greatly from this total injustice. On the 7th of July 21, I stated in this House that the loan charge was going to be the next post office scandal. We'll just look where we are with that today. Will it take another form of stocks and other ITV drama to expose and to publicly humiliate HMRC or the government into some action on, that, on this loan charge scandal? Unfortunately, Madam Deputy Speaker, it would seem so, but I certainly hope not. Madam Deputy Speaker, as others have said, it's vitally important a vitally important part of the loan charge scandal is that these ordinary people were contract workers doing a job of work for somebody or some organisation who simply needed their services. Most importantly, they were workers. And as workers, that entitled them to protection under the agency rules. The agency rules, the agency rules determined that their employer, be that the agency, the umbrella company or another body, in the supply chain or the end client itself, were liable to deduct the correct amount of PEYE from these workers and pay that to HMRC at the time before paying the worker their salary. These companies simply just did not do this. HMRC were well aware of these arrangements and did not pursue, as others have said, any of these entities as the employer of these workers. 
for the tax. HMRC were also well aware many, many years down the line that they were legally out of time to do so. HMRC have had and still have a duty to establish who the employer was, who was directing, controlling and supervising the worker that had been supplied. They had not done so. Done so. They have failed time and time again to do so. Hence the invention of this retrospective loan charge to get around that very inconvenient and uncomfortable fact. It is entirely unacceptable to continue to hound ordinary people, ordinary workers, with no rights, no funds or legal defence against such a powerful government body as HMRC. This, Madam Deputy Speaker, has all the hallmarks of this post office scandal. And what is really vexatious and concerning, Madam Deputy Speaker, is this. HMRC continue to hoodwink MPs into believing they are going after the promoters who put these workers into this abominable position, when we all know they are not doing so. And yet a further issue in this, as others have said, these groups of companies, these promoters, which sold arrangements to, reef, to the freelancers, they have not only not been asked to pay a penny for the disputed tax, but their arrangements have caused the debt arrangements have caused the death of poor souls who were so distressed by the way they had been hounded and criminalised by HMRC, they took their own lives. And we all know that HMRC have stated, as been said again by a total of 10 people, have taken their lives in this scandal. That is likely to be far more in reality in this awful and unravelling scandal. Mm -hmm. The post office scandal is likely to be dwarfed in numbers by the retrospective loan charge scandal, purely and simply by the numbers of people affected, between 60,000 and 70,000 we're hearing, at the last count by HMRC, and that figure probably is likely to be far more, as too many ordinary people are facing huge bills, many of whom have been suffering untold distress for many years, and in some cases, personal harm and indeed suicide. And because of this ongoing retrospective loan charge scandal, the whole thing is an absolute total mess. And to finish, Madam Deputy Speaker, being mindful of all these serious issues, and as I'm sure the ministers must be now, can or will the relevant minister, finance minister, and the government now speedily, speedily commit themselves to finally commissioning, this time a truly independent review, to deal with the mess caused by, wholly by HMRC's own making, and thereby allow us as MPs, parliamentarians, to help right this grievous wrong. Sarah Brickcliffe. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is such an important issue for constituents, um, and I am really grateful for the Honourable Member for bringing it to this House. It's been mentioned, given the recent examples that have exposed excesses of power in public bodies. It's only right that the loan charge and the way it's infringing on the rights of individuals is debated in this House. One particular case in my constituency brought this to my attention. And for me, it highlights several problems with the way in which HMRC has tried to combat disguised remuneration schemes through the loan charge. The way in which HMRC is retrospectively trying to obtain income tax and national insurance contributions raises important questions. The first is that the law, when it comes to taxes, should be knowable and accessible to the people it applies. Based on the case I've seen in my constituency, this was clearly not the case. Many individuals who work for agencies simply did not know that their pay would one day be subject to a disputed tax argument with HMRC because a loan charge did not exist or because they were missold such schemes from hiring agencies. To add to this fundamental trespassing on the rights of individuals, we cannot continue with a situation whereby a public body is pursuing retrospective actions against our constituents with their rights, not be, uh, with no right to due process for our own constituents. Well, then, yeah. 
My Honourable Fred, forgive me. Well, first of all, can I thank the Honourable uh, 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 gentleman from East Antrim for his kind words in my time as Postal Affairs Minister. But does my Honourable Fred agree with me, and she's making the point, I think, is, uh, that, that I agree with, that the fact that it's a really good example of why what retrospective policy is not a good idea, the fact that uh, HMRC needs to use their investigative powers, which outstrip uh, policemen uh, proportionately, the fact that actually they should be going after the practitioners of this, the promoters of this, which they can do in the Disqualified Directors Act, which I passed a few years ago. And they shouldn't be going after contractors, consultants, self-employed people who government and many government institutions treat of as, treat as tax evaders as default, yeah. as was seen as the, uh, the three million excluded during COVID who fell, who didn't get the support that other people did. And, and that, that brings me actually onto one of the main points, because these are ordinary workers. These are our constituents. They're not fat cats. They haven't got offshore bank accounts. They're not like that. These are ordinary members of the public that desperately need our help. Um, and so, and that brings me on to another point. Um, the way in which HMRC are actually handling these cases, which is not unfair to say, is hardly a lesson in how to handle dispute resolution or customer service. One of my constituents received a letter some four or five years ago telling that, them that HMRC was withdrawing their information notice that they had sent to them in the post. As far, far as my constituent was concerned, that was the end of the matter and they could get on with their family life. There was no contact for a further three years, but now HMRC has informed my constituent that withdrawing an information notice was not the same as withdrawing their concerns and in any event they are not aware of the reason for their withdrawal in the first place and that they would like to revisit the matter. I would say to ministers that this situation is untenable. HMRC cannot have the power to suddenly request tens of thousands of pounds from individuals, appear to drop a case, then revive it on a whim without any explanation at all. That in itself is an exercise in excessive power used by a public body. So what we should be doing again is going after the disputed tax from those who promoted and operated the schemes and who made huge amounts of money from doing so. And I understand that might be more complex, but that should not be a barrier. We should be protecting ordinary workers from abuses of power and pursuing those opaque and moneyed bodies who sought to gain the system. And it's on that note that I would like to end and echo that these are ordinary people that we are trying to assist. And it is now time that the government acted. Yeah. Neil Hanvey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Honourable Gentleman from East uh, Antrim for bringing forward this debate. It's an incredibly important debate. It's been an issue that's been live for far too long, uh, and uh, the damage that's been inflicted on thousands of ordinary workers who are freelancers, contractors, temporary workers, uh, and their families because of this loan charge is really uh, quite distressing. And the parallel that he drew uh, with the Horizon scandal is absolutely real. Uh, this is a, a matter of serious injustice. But what is, uh, what is uh, um, different to the Horizon scandal, at least the Horizon victims had the appearance of justice. It may not have been justice, but they had the appearance of justice. But as the uh, Honourable Member for Buckingham made clear, HMRC have persisted and acted as judge, jury and executioner with a ruthlessness that I cannot believe. I've been in meetings with HMRC and they have advised me, oh, we will never um, put people under enormous pressure. We won't take more than 50% of the disposable income to recover the costs. But that is simply not true. The, ver the verocity, the, the, way, the way they have gone after my constituents and the amount of money that they have demanded is eye-watering and a completely uh, 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 un uh, impossible for, for my constituents to meet. Yes, please. I mean, a very simple point that um, occurs to me, that the real similarity between the Horizon programme and this was that during Horizon, those who were prosecuted, put in jail, etc., Got, they were, the reputation the uh, post office put about, they were greedy people who had stolen money. Yeah. So the public didn't at first have any sympathy. 
Here with this, very similar to that, HMRC has basically said they were greedy people evading tax that other people then had to pick up and pay, so the public still hadn't picked up on this. They were not, and that is the key point, and breaking through that will get public support for something to change. I, I thank the, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman for, for that point because not only were the victims of the loan charge victims of mis-selling, they are now victims of the pursuit of the HMRC against them for every penny they could possibly earn, not just now, but for future years. Uh, and so it is, uh, the point is incredibly important and of course it's important to remember that a number of years ago we had an opportunity with new clause 31 that was supported by the APPG to write off uh, the retrospective element of this and unfortunately because of the timidity of some members in this house that amendment was not put forward for a vote and that is uh, deeply regrettable. Uh, the, uh, also four years ago I think it's important now I speak about my constituents which are my uh, main concern in all of this. I spoke about the horrific plight of my constituent, Doug, Doug Aiken, who was facing a bill of half a million pounds. To pay this off, he would lose his house, his car, his, uh, as a self-employed person, he would lose his business because he would be bankrupt. Uh, and the government just simply did not listen. And he was one of those who had successive completed and closed tax years that were reopened by HMRC and all of these supposed earnings that he had secreted away, he was being charged these exorbitant rates for that were completely unjustifiable and unjustified. Uh, and today I want to speak about another constituent of mine, Alan Geddes, who has a disposable income, disposable income of £360 a month. And the payment that is demanded by the HMRC on Mr Geddes is £783 a month, and that is for the next 12 years. But that is not the only charge that they are asking Mr Geddes to pay. They are asking him to pay £50,000 up front. And the Honourable Gentleman, and, I will, of course. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and he and many other colleagues across the House have made analogies in their excellent speeches so far in this debate uh, between the horrors of the uh, Horizon Post Office IT scandal and the scandal around the loan charge, which has affected so many uh, of our constituents. But I will share with him and the Chamber, perhaps, uh, another analogy. Is he aware that uh, HMRC also use a apparently bomb-proof and with a system from Fujitsu? Well, <laughs> the Honourable Gentleman makes a very interesting point that I think members across the House will now pay very close attention to, and I thank him for doing so. Um, but not only are they asking for £50,000 up, up front, they've put £50,000 £50, lien against his home, uh, and although his income has now dropped below 360 uh, as uh, disposable incomes dropped below £360 a month because of the cost of living crisis, the HMRC has suggested that perhaps they should renegotiate his terms to bring that down to £361.13, but for him to be able to get that new rate, he needs to give them another £50,000, uh, uh, and that would, uh, those other charges would continue uh, for further, a further 12 years. So the question is, what planet are the HMRC on? These shocking figures exclude interest being added to allow the payments to be spread over 12 years and is clear daylight robbery. Now, uh, the ministers uh, in the department have previously advised me of the following, that approximately 80% of the 3.4 billion HMRC has recovered through disguised remuneration settlements uh, between the budget of 2016 and the end of March 2022 has been from employers. And so I am, am I therefore correct that, uh, in presuming that this figure is 2.72 billion? And given the sum which HMRC expected to be brought into charge from employers has already been exceeded, I would again ask why HMRC needed to pursue loan charge customers for 100% of the tax, plus interest, plus APN penalties, plus, plus inheritance tax, particularly 
when HMRC was fully aware that customers had already suffered a 15 to 20 percent deduction on their earnings yeah, through yeah. the missed sold schemes. Additionally, I would like to learn why HMRC continues to pursue customers with loans prior to uh, uh, the December 2010 date, when Morse already pardoned those with no open inquiries on the basis that the law was not clear. Um, these key factors, of course, could all be addressed because HMRC has the facility to amend its settlement terms. It requires no legislation or change in the law, and I would hope that the Minister would ask the HMRC to apply the same treatment to those who have already settled. Uh, as M M members across the House have been screaming on this issue until they are hoarse, we have sent repeated letters sent by 120 MPs, uh, the publications put forward by the APPG and debates in this chamber, but it's simply not enough. People are at the brink of despair, and if we were to prevent any more constituents from resorting to suicide, then we must urgently deal with this issue and grapple it in a way that was not done over the Horizon scandal. Thank you. Uh, order, because um, uh, some colleagues have taken slightly uh, less than seven minutes, I do have a bit of leeway. Um, I don't want that to be extended massively, but if, um, if colleagues wish to speak for perhaps a couple of minutes more than seven, I'd be content with that. Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and may I join in congratulating the Honourable Gentleman, the Member from East Antrim, in getting this important debate, because this is why Parliament exists. We are here to seek redress of grievance from an overmighty executive which abuses its power. And this is an absolutely classic example of the state abusing its power through aggressive tax collection. Why is it that in the Bible, the tax collector is seen as the villain in almost every occasion that the tax collector is referred to because the tax collector seeks to extract more than is by law allowed. And in our system, it has always been the case that the job of the tax collector is to raise the tax set out by Parliament, not a penny more, nor a penny less. Not a penny more. It is not for the tax collector to squeeze out extra from people if that is not was what intended. And we know from the discussion that we have had today that HMRC itself did not think there was anything wrong with these schemes early on. And why do we know that? Well, as the Honourable Gentleman from East Antrim pointed out, they employed people using these schemes. So either we're saying HMRC is so incompetent that it has no idea on the basis on which it is employing people, or that actually, because it saved some money, it thought these schemes were licit. And the other thing we know is that constituents of ours sent in tax returns acknowledging that they were using these schemes, and HMRC did not question them. And then, in a panic, worried about the tax receipts that were coming in, 2010 is an important date when tax receipts were very low. When the country had an enormous deficit, a squeeze gets put on, and a squeeze gets put on that becomes retrospective. But retrospective legislation is something that is basically unconstitutional, except in extraordinary circumstances. Whenever there is any retrospective part of legislation, it has to be specifically approved and cleared by the Attorney General before it can be brought before this House. Why is that? As a safeguard of a constitutional right that people know the basis of the law under which they are operating. And this is surely proper. Because when you have retrospective legislation, people who have behaved properly, have behaved honestly, have followed the law that Parliament had passed, suddenly find that they didn't. But that is entirely unfair and unreasonable and could criminalise any of us for actions we committed years ago. I give way to my honourable friend. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. 
Would he agree with me that uh, the presumption of in, uh, innocence until proven guilty in all of these scandals are turned on their head where it's presumption of guilt mm. and unable to prove oneself sentenced? And, and to use a, a Bible analogy, this isn't so much David versus Goliath. It's David versus an army of Goliaths, and David has the slingshot taken away from him. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. And the extraordinary powers of HMRC, that HMRC, the amalgamation of the inland revenue and customs and excise, customs and excise historically maintained extraordinary prerogative powers, much greater, actually, than those of the inland revenue. And you have seen the coming together of those two bodies bringing a more aggressive culture to our tax system, which assumes that taxpayers, following the law as they understand it, and indeed as HMRC understood it, may be doing something wrong. And that is a bad principle under which to operate. And we need to be looking after, as members are, the interests of constituents who are being affected in this way. We need to allow people to know that their tax affairs are cleared after an inquiry hasn't been opened. Now, that's set out. There is a 12-month period in which tax returns remain open. There's a seven-year period under which people have to keep records. And yet we've passed retrospective legislation that overturns all of that. And my um, honourable friend, my rival friend, the member for New Forest West, loves you right to say that those of us who were here in 2017 should be appalled that this was able to get through without being noticed, without being stopped. And we should look so carefully, and I thought what he said to the minister was absolutely right, we should look very carefully at the ministerial responses. Because HMRC does have this odd situation of being a non-ministerial department. It is not properly accountable. With most departments, the minister says go, and at least theoretically they goeth. With HMRC... Their independence is such that they can effectively ignore ministerial control. But that should work two ways. If the minister cannot control HMRC, he should not read out the rubbish they provide for him to read out from the dispatch box. And he should be very well aware of the warnings that have been given of ministers who have been willing to read out things that then in future turn out um, either to be untrue or not to have asked the right questions. And I'm also very much looking forward to the shadow minister's speech because the shadow minister has the advantage of independence and not having gone native by virtue of being in the Treasury and bringing, I hope, an independent mind to this, bearing in mind there will be an election this year, and who knows what may happen in that and what responsibilities may fall upon his shoulders, and that it would be really important to know that the opposition is going to be on the side of proper constitutional practice. The whole point of our system is that we come here, and we have done since the 13th century, to seek redress of grievance for our constituents when they are badly treated. This is a classic example. And governments are appalling at answering it, absolutely appalling. People have mentioned the post office, but it's not just the post office. It's Hillsborough, it's infected blood. For some strange reason, governments have a desire to defend the mistakes of long-since-past administrations, and they do that to the disadvantage of constituents today. I hope on this occasion it will not happen, or at least will not continue to happen. There is an ability to set it right, and there is an ability for this House to do more. Because if HMRC isn't producing documents, there are things up our sleeves. The Backbench Business Committee can allow humble addresses to be put forward. There are things this House can do to continue to exert pressure. But it would be so much better if the Minister of the Dispatch Box, who is one of the most able and intelligent ministers in this current administration, were to grasp this deal with it and save our constituents from further pain and, frankly, put HMRC in its box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our Williams. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and it's a pleasure to agree with so many honourable and right honourable members. That's a, it's a new novel experience for myself, I have to say, from this bench. Um, looking at the, uh, the history of this scandal, it reminds me of the time when uh, many of our constituents were claiming 
uh, working tax credits, and sometimes they were overpaid, and they would receive letters from uh, the revenue. Uh, these letters were standard letters, but they were stitched together of individual clauses to give the semblance of being personalised. And uh, one sentence is, uh, is etched on my memory, uh, uh, and it goes like this, uh, even though we told you that your assessment was correct, it was not re reasonable for you to believe so. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. That's a lie to tell, aren't you? This, though, is an extremely <laughs> serious matter. And uh, thinking how I had approached this, uh, I thought I'd just tell the story of one of my own constituents, Rob Cowan, who is a victim of uh, the loan charge candle. But I do speak uh, today for my other colleagues in Plaid Cymru, particularly my own right honourable friend of, from Dwyfor Merioni, who can't be here today, though she would wish to be. So. Now, while some people have gained financially uh, through the use of umbrella organisations and services, Rob Cowan was using it, uh, using the scheme on advice uh, as a simple accounting service uh, so that he could be paid legally and conveniently, as so many other people found. He had sought the advice from accountants who assured him that the product that he was using was legal. It was only later, of course, that he found out that it was not so. He suffered immensely since then. Back in 2011, he was considering winding down his business. He was in his early 50s, thinking of winding down his business, changing his work pattern, moving from full-time to part-time work, uh, enjoying the fruits of his, uh, of his work for many, many decades. He then started receiving communications from HMRC, informing him that he was liable uh, to pay back thousands of pounds due to the loan charge. This forced him back into full-time work, uh, but what happened with him was that it aggravated the repetitive strain injury that he had developed over the course of his working life. And this eventually led him to becoming disabled so that he could no longer work, could no longer get an income to pay back the loan, the money uh, that was due under the loan charge, and found himself at the age of 63, um, unable to work, unable to pay back uh, the money allegedly that he owed and facing a very, very bleak future. He now has no savings, no ability to work, can't pay the HMRC the money they say he owes them. He has suffered psychological and physical trauma from this ordeal, as so many people have. Just for one example, and it's, it's a common one, I'm, I'm very sorry to say, he told me recently that he was unable to switch the heating on during this cold, very cold period. He can't afford it, as so many other people have found. I will indeed. Thank you, Lord Gentleman, for giving way and, and for sharing that powerful example. And I also have constituents in my Livingston constituency who have suffered and who have come to see me. And I am reminded, as the Right Honourable Gentleman opposite was talking about the other scandals that we have faced and challenged in this place of the Primados scandal and the words um, of Baroness Cumberledge of first do no harm. It should be the duty of government, the government of the day and of this place to do first do no harm to our constituents. And when harm is done uh, and policies are got wrong as this one has been proven, surely it is the duty of government and HMRC to take some responsibility and not put the Honourable Gentleman's constituents, my constituents and other constituents through, frankly, hell before they get the justice that they need. How many folk need to die, more people need to die, before this will be sorted out? Well, I thank you for the, the powerful point. You know, the, it's an old sword, but justice delayed is just denied, uh, quite obviously the case in, in this matter. Um, my constituents also points to the stigma that uh, is associated with what has happened to him, as other honourable, and right honourable gentlemen have pointed out. Um, he feels that he is in the wrong. He's been made to feel as if he had done something wrong when he himself thought that he had acted in good faith throughout, as well as seeking expert advice and being advised, following the advice that he was given, because he had no intention, of course, of doing anything wrong. In contrast, as has been pointed out, and I'll finish on this point, the owners of the companies which ran these schemes have meanwhile made considerable sums of money. Rob feels that he's uh, been denied the fair hearing, whilst other people have, have got away with it, essentially. Mm -hmm. I think, as the Honourable Gentleman who spoke first, I think, or second, said uh, the HMRC are being judge, jury and executioner in their own case, which is obviously wrong. People are receiving retrospective punishments, even though they have acted in good faith. Mm -hmm. There must be justice for Rob Cowan. There must be justice for the other victims of the, these uh, schemes and the HMRC's behaviour. And uh, I join the calls on the Minister to act quickly. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, Sir David Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'll try not to repeat all the self tr- self-evident truths that have been uh, stated throughout this debate uh, in the interest of time. The, hon- the Honourable Member for East Antrim made a characteristically fluent uh, exposition of the case, uh, and everybody from him through to my right honourable friend for uh, North East Som- Somerset reiterated essentially the same point, which is all of a sudden, in the last few weeks, the public has become aware of the fact that state, huge state or quasi-state organisations put their own interests ahead of the interests of the public, and that that, unfortunately, is not abnormal behaviour. Now, he, he uh, also, he, and of course he characterised that, uh, quite rightly, um, uh, as being repeated in a high-handed and insensitive way by the HMRC. But, uh, frankly, I think he understated the point. And why do I think that? Because the HMRC has referred itself to the, uh, uh, the Independent Office for Police Conduct over those ten suicides and some other uh, attempted suicides and health harm. That is as close as you get when dealing with government departments to a confession. They know they have done wrong. And they've known it for some time, and they've known the consequences of the death of people, and enormous harm to people, and yet they have continued to do the same thing over and over again. So I was thinking, how on earth do they justify that to themselves when they look at themselves in the mirror? And the only thing I can come up with is that they think this is a deterrent to this behaviour in future. This is because this, uh, clearly it's not going to raise that much money. Three quarters are going to go bankrupt. So. It's a deterrent, maybe. Well, if it's a deterrent, that brings us to the next question that the right honourable, the honourable member uh, raised, which is why, in that case, do they no, not go after the promoters? The promoters exacted 18 to 20 percent of the incomes of these people in carrying out this scheme. So there is a large sum of money there. Somebody said hundreds of millions. Indeed, it may even be that the, the victims of the scheme, that's the right word, thought that that was a tax deduction, because it's of that sort of order of magnitude. So why, why have they not done that? Well, um, we know, of course, uh, that uh, many of the organisations using these, these uh, promoters and contractors were state organisations, including uh, HMRC themselves. So that might be a reason. That might be they don't want to embarrass themselves. It might be because of that, it might be because of that, that they are complicit in over, uh, overt, uh, over covert advice to those contractors at the beginning. It's entirely possible they approved it, and those documents are hidden away in HMRC. So what's the answer to that? Now, my right honourable friend, the member for Chingford, was not quite right in it saying that they are completely protected. There's one body the Public Accounts Committee, that can get at this. And one of the things I think should come out of this debate is a Public Accounts Committee should look at the documents, not the numbers, the documents that are, that are uh, associated with those early contracts and see why they were done. Because that would be one way uh, to get past uh, my uh, uh, honourable friend for uh, North West Hampshire. Yeah. Um, uh, assertion that this can't deliver a practical outcome. That's one practical outcome it can deliver. The second practical outcome we can deliver amongst ourselves is to address the fact that this is retrospective taxation. Our country, as, as my right honourable friend quite rightly pointed out, does not believe that people who commit, who undergo, undertake behaviour which is not illegal at some point in time, should be prosecuted if it becomes illegal in a future point in time. And exactly the same, in fact, that applies in spades to taxes. So one of the things I wanted to do early on in our collective campaign was to, was to move a motion in the House uh, in the beginning of the budget under the general uh, debate, the general motion that's normally put, to actually ban, explicitly ban, retrospective taxation. And guess what happened? The Treasury have never since then moved the general motion. We always get narrow finance uh, motions, narrow finance bill motions. It makes it very, very difficult to change anything. So what what I have done is, uh, uh, in the past, write to the Procedure Committee, and I gather they're still concerned about it, asking them 
to request the return of the general motion at the beginning of the, of the budget. Then we can actually put to the House. Now, in those days, we probably didn't have the 100-plus supporters that we now have. Today, we could probably carry that motion. So I would ask everybody here, and taking part in this debate, to support that and write themselves, in fact, I might write around and ask everybody, write themselves to the Procedure Committee and try to get that corrected so that we can actually use initiative on this in a second. We can use our right of initiative, because we don't have very much right of initiative in this, in this House anymore, use our right of initiative to stop this explicitly. I'll give away. I agree with him entirely in relation to the amendment of the law resolution. In fact, whenever I've spoken in a finance bill since it has stopped being common practice to use it, I have mentioned the fact that we should have an amendment of the law resolution. I do appreciate what he's saying about the um, Procedure Committee. As a member of the Procedure Committee, we have looked at this, but ultimately it is the responsibility of the government to make this change. They need to put in the amendment of the law resolution, and the previous Chancellor was very clear that it was a small technical change that he was not going to change. Forgive me, but I've been here a long time, and the Procedure Committee can do it. They can put it to the House. They can themselves seek a bank backbench motion. And guess what? We can move back backbench motions which instruct the government. We did it, some may remember, on prisoner votes, and we won that day. So it's about time we exerted our own rights in this House on this matter. Now, the last point I want to make is that this was made, this whole thing was, uh, if not precipitated, certainly made worse by the 1999 uh, move by the government uh, to, uh, with uh, what's now known as IR35. The complex rules associated yeah. with that um, uh, triggered this part of this behaviour plan. Uh, and what's interesting in this is that the behaviour of the uh, HMRC on IRT, IR35 pretty much mirrors their behaviour on the loan charge. Yeah, yeah. There are a large number of people out there, one of them, okay, Adam, is, is in, the, in the gallery today, uh, who have been f frankly oppressed by HMRC. What do they do? They, you, they have a, 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 an argument over, over some money, let's say, I don't know, £70,000, eh? and you win the first tribunal, so they appeal. They win, you win the upper tribunal, so they appeal again and take it to court. And the court then, of course, sends you back to the beginning and you do it again. And they're doing exactly, I mean, the House will remember a previous backbench debate when we uh, started the uh, action against slaps, the use by oligarchs of their huge financial power to destroy people. What are the HMRC doing? Precisely the same thing. So the government's at the moment moving to stop oligarchs doing what it does itself. Right? So we need to look at that too. Uh, IR35 is a disgrace. When, an uh, when a state organisation with infinite resources, actually your and my tax money, but infinite resources, uses that power to overrule and, over, uh, and, and uh, reduce uh, the ability of ordinary citizens to protect themselves, then I'm afraid that is behaving in a sort of, I'll give away in a second, uh, behaving in a sort of way uh, that uh, countries behind the Iron Curtain used to behave. I give away. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for, for giving way and his powers of forensic analysis are second to none, but would he agree with me that it's actually slightly worse than that? He's entirely right in what he says, but there are also cases, particularly uh, for those uh, affected by the loan charge, who have allowed themselves, against their better instincts and judgment, to make a false confession, if you like, of guilt, gone through the process, ended up having to pay an extortionate amount of money, thinking it was settled, and then HMRC have come back and then gone after even more. Yes, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I'm afraid... I mean, he's right. Um, I, I, I'm afraid one of the characteristics of miscarriages of justice, and somebody raised it, I've forgotten who raised it earlier, so forgive me for not giving you reference, is that the victim at the beginning is probably the most unpopular person in society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're thought to be guilty. They may even doubt themselves whether they've made a mistake. You know? These people, to, by and large, have been compelled to do what we're talking about. They've been offered a job on these terms only, right? So they had no choice. But then, of course, later I think, well, maybe I should have known. You know, and then, the, 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 then they're persuaded by the people dealing with them, as the post office, postmasters were told, you're the only one. You know? And they, they, all these people feel the same. Until our campaign started, 
Well, they all felt the same. You're the only one, you're one of a few nasty tax evaders, not avoiders, yeah, tax right. evaders. Uh, and so they give in. And of course, confession is like the Gestapo, confession never saves you. you know? Confession's a step to execution. And, and so that's how it works, I'm afraid. And this, this is true of all big organisations, full of well-intentioned people, but who defend the institution. And that's why, answering my uh, right honourable friend for, for, for North East Somerset, um, that goes on through government after government after government, it's not the ministers. It's not the ministers who do this. It's the, it's the members of the um, institution. I give way to my right honourable friend. Very quickly, I, I, I get all of that, and you're right, and he's right about uh, the departments, but there is a peculiarity about HMRC with the powers that they have and the lack of accountability they have. Don't publish accounts. And literally, ministers come and go and don't really run that, that, that single department. And that really is the issue. So bad as it might be elsewhere, it's astonishingly bad now because of the HMRC ability. Well, in, in fact, our right honourable friend listed a few of the others yeah. from Hillsborough onwards. Yeah. So it does come back. And I'm afraid even his own department, his old department, DWP, has its own police force in effect, its own prosecutors. Uh, th that's one of the clues. This is something which will come back time and again. It will come back with HMRC and others. And uh, he's, But of course he's right. We need to hold this organisation to account. It serves the people, not the, even the government of the day. This organisation, the parliament, is the institution that serves the people, and we should be holding it to account. And I start by Public Accounts Committee, but there are many others that should, should get involved in that. Now, I've given a completely different speech to the one I intended, uh, because, because everybody else has said everything first. Um, but I will finish with something I certainly had the intent to do, and that's to, frankly, uh, give a piece of... Um, you know, the, the BBC once re 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 uh, referred to me as an old war horse. Quite right. So I shall give him some old, uh, some old war horse advice, having been there once or twice myself. The le one of the lessons of the last few weeks is that ministers, junior ministers in particular, are very, very easily led to give answers in the chamber which are the dead bat answers. They're the answers handed to you by your, your officials. So you, and I'm afraid you don't actually have any others to give unless you want to end your career on the spot. I know I've done that twice, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> the, so unless you want to end your career on the spot. But the, but the simple truth is that unless he wants to be seen, well, maybe he wants to be a future leader of the Liberal Democrat Party, I don't know, but, but unless he wants to be seen in the same light as those ministers in the past, not today, not in terms of his answer to us today, but in terms of what he says when he goes back to the department, yeah. yep. I want to see the truth. Here are the things you've done. You know, why, why did you not tell the House of Lords why you're not pursuing uh, the promoters of these schemes? Why did you still, why did you tell people you only go for half their disposable income, but you're not doing that? Get the answers, Minister. Get the answers. And then when you next come back to the chamber, because you will have to come back to this chamber again, you can give us the truth. <coughs> uh, John McDonnell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, like, like everyone else in the chamber today, I have constituents who have been affected in a way which is uh, incredibly distressing. So I can, I can understand completely the howls of outrage that are taking place ac across the house today. I want to, I want to deal with process, though. Um, some honourable members who are here today were in the debate in 2019. And um, if I was shadow, uh, shadow Chancellor then, and I'd like people to look at the speech that was made by the Honourable Member for West Ham. She was in my Treasury team, she spoke from the front bench, and she set out exactly case after case, as people have done today. There was one additional case that we drew upon as well, where it hasn't been mentioned today, where because of cuts in local councils and elsewhere, staff had been laid off and then rehired on this basis as well by public bodies, which was particularly shocking. But let me read the ministerial response that was given then, because I think it's something we should learn from. The minister then, the Se Treasury Secretary, said, although I have tremendous sympathy for those facing large tax bills, it's unfair to let people get away with not paying the tax they owe. There is support for people who have used these schemes and now find themselves in difficult situations, which will require those affected to approach HMRC and bring the matter to a close. 
And that was the ministerial response. I don't think we can tolerate a similar ministerial response because four years on, that response led to immense human suffering and including, as some people said, unfortunately, some people losing their lives because they did approach HMRC, many of them. They tried to negotiate deals. Deals were not... Um, they, there was no element of clemency or understanding of the individual plight of those people. And as a result of that, many of our constituents suffered so badly. So I, I just want to come to move on to try and get some resolution of this. Um, I'm hoping that what we can agree today, and then the government will respond, is that we, we do seek a review, but that review should be immediate. It should be time limited in months, not years. It should be truly independent, and independence assured by those victims um, of the independence of it. And it should propose a sp specific range of resolutions. I actually do think that specific range of resolutions will have to include some element of compensation for what people have suffered. And I also do think that a review should look at where that compensation should come from. So I don't think it could, should come from other taxpayers. I actually do think it should be a levy on those who've promoted these schemes and maybe across some elements of the, fin the, the finance and accountancy sector that were implicated in this up to their necks, to be frank. That's the first thing. The second thing, I actually do think we need to review the role of ourselves in this as well and what's happened over time. And I agree what was proposed by the Honourable Member for Helton, Price and Howden. I think the, the Procedures Committee should look at the, the role of the House in all of this, but I also think the Public Accounts Committee should look at how we've arrived at this situation. Let me just give you two examples of the background to this as well. Um, HMRC has come under considerable criticism today, which much of which I agree with. And what I'm saying now is not in mitigation of their role, but actually to try and have some element of understanding of what's been going on with HMRC. HMRC has been under pressure rightfully from all of us across the House to tackle tax avoidance and evasion. In fact, we've led campaigns, some of us over the last 20 years to try and get HMRC to work effectively on this. But at the same time as putting them under that pressure to tackle the tax gap, and I pay tribute to the government and actually, actually did this, the first government that identified a tax gap, 38 billion, whatever it was. I disagree with the figures, but at least we, we had a target to aim for. But at the same time of that, actually both parties in the last 20 odd years have excelled in a Dutch auction to how much the staffing levels in HMRC be, be cut. And there's ways, I can understand if you want to reduce staffing, but there's ways of doing it. And the way it's been done in HMRC for quite a while has been quite brutal. So that's resulted in a, in a schemes of redundancy where a whole wave, a generation of expertise was lost. And what that meant to the culture of HMRC, from my understanding, is that the, as a result of that, they were looking for shortcuts and how to meet the demand for tackling tax avoidance, tax evasion, and to tackle the tax gap. And I think this was one of the shortcuts that they invented. And I think in latter days, it must probably there would have been wiser heads within HMRC itself to say this wasn't the route to go down and it would only cause more problems than it would do solutions. And I think there is a culture in HMRC that's been developed as a result of that of secrecy and protectionism. And we need to understand that if we're going to really tackle this as an institutional failing. The second element, we need to look at the role this house played. I, I was trying to remember the 2017 when going back to what was happening in the house at, at the time. And some, some members will remember what happened was that there wasn't a normal process for the finance bill because what happened was is that the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, who was Prime Minister at the time, um, was assuring us all that there wouldn't be a general election. I think in the House he assured us five times. They, they went for a walk in Wales and come back, came back and declared the election. So the finance bill, the finance measures, were then thrown into the wash-up procedure. And members will know what the wash-up procedure is. It's where the political parties sit down to see what will go through, what's urgent and has to go through. And so what was agreed then is that the finance bill would go through in one day's debate. And as a result of that, 
this measure was introduced. Now, I, want, I would like the PAC committee and the rules committee to look at how that process worked and how it didn't work. But the Honourable Member for Alton Price and Howder makes an incredibly valid point, which we made at the time on every finance bill, budget bill that came forward, is that when the government introduced the no amendment to law procedure, it completely tied the hands of this House of what, what it could do, what it could open up, what debates it could have, what amendments it could bring forward. And that was introduced by um, uh, Lord Hammond, I think almost unprecedented. And as a result of that, it did tie the hands of this House, even investigating issues around the, the budget further and the finance bills further. And in addition to that, I also think that we need to look at the process by which ministers and opposition are able to really question impact assessments and how they're developed and the independence of those impact assessments as well. I, I still find it difficult that impact assessments are prepared largely by the department and ministerial, ministerial team that are promoting the piece of legislation rather than done independently. And I think if there had been an independent impact assessment of this and a proper debate and time for a debate and time for amendment as well, I don't think the House would have agreed to go down this course because for me, Looking back on it now, um, some of these should have, been drawn to, should have been drawn to the whole House's attention of what the implications were, because this, the impression that was given was that this would be focused on, a, if you like, a small number of hard case tax avoiders or tax evaders and their promoters. Yeah. Well, I agree with nearly everything you say, but why can't we address it now? Why can't we go back and put it right? The point I'm raising is to enable us to do that, because I think that's exactly right. Uh, and I'm hoping that part of the lessons being learnt um, are learnt by not just the whole House, but by government as well, whichever administration is in power. Because as soon as you introduce measures like this to fetter the role of individual members of the House or the House altogether, I think that's when you open up the opportunity for mistakes being made that because policies are not effectively tested in the democratic debate within this chamber. So I'd welcome those reviews to take place, but as a matter of urgency. And the point I simply want to make is that if nothing else, I don't want to be here in a few years' time like we were in 2019, we're now 2024. I don't want to be here in 2026 or 27 or 28 or whatever, and we're going through the same situation but more people have suffered and, and worryingly more, more people may not be with us as a result of this because they've taken their own lives. So I think there's an element of urgency about rectifying this and doing it um, with compassion and using clemency in many of these instances as well. And that will enable us then to really focus on tackling tax avoidance, avoidance and tax evasion and also the institutional arrangements that there are for enabling that to happen, because I do think we need to have a thorough debate in this House about the regulatory mechanisms that we have, particularly with regard to the accountancy and the finance sector. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's been said a lot this afternoon, but in the last few weeks, the number of times I think I've uh, spoken in here about the post office scandal, I think is well known. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it has rightly dominated our headlines. But the question that we probably haven't addressed enough is why? And I think the parallels of why we've addressed the post office scandal and then the very encouraging speeches we've had this afternoon are all parallels for the same reason. Because if there's one thing that the British people hate more than anything else, it is injustice. And it is the injustice of the loan charge scandal which makes this so important. Because the stark reality is, is that those people that were impacted by it have had their lives ruined in just the same levels in terms of financial impacts as well as personal and family impacts as those that are impacted by the post office scandal. Now, I've been a member of the loan uh, charge APPG since I was elected, spoken in the House about it, and listened to some absolutely harrowing accounts back 
when I was first elected, when the APPG ran some of those sessions, of people who were innocently caught up in this situation. And they, that has included some of my constituents. And one of my constituents I'm going to just speak about uh, now. Uh, he is called Peter Phillips from North Norfolk. And he fell into the loan scheme on the advice of tax professionals as a means to be clear of and compliant with IR35. You couldn't make that up. And there was never any intent at all to be avoiding tax. Simply this was a means to keep his standard of living and income that working as a contractor afforded. Now, I have had the chance to get to know Peter over the last four years since my election. Of course, there was a period of time where I probably wouldn't wake up in the morning without an email from Peter. And I say that, he's watching as well. Um, but he is a good, decent, kind man. A law-abiding man, like so many of our constituents that we have spoken about this afternoon. If he had been aware of HMRC's view on these schemes, he would have never have chosen that route. But it was never made plain to him, either by the tax professionals or HMRC. In addition to that, he knew many other contractors who had been working through loan schemes for many years without any issues with HMRC. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, he has settled uh, his scheme with HMRC and quite rightly is totally and utterly aggrieved by the unfairness but that because what he was told by HMRC was that he became, because he told HMRC of what he had done, he became an easy target. While the others who did not are getting away with it, so to speak. Now, that is grossly unfair and unjust. Now, in the loan charge scenario, HMRC are treating the loans as income and loans to the individual's estate at the same time. And therefore, in Peter's case, are forcing him to pay income tax and IHT on these amounts. And let's be fair about <coughs> this. We've been talking about it for a while. Many of the victims are older. And as they get older, they are thinking about planning for their families. And those issues become even more of a worry and pertinent. Now, I don't think that he should, but he is prepared to accept that he made an error of judgment. Of course, he didn't make an error of judgment, in my view. This is retrospective uh, penalisation by HMRC. But at the very least, HMRC are equally at fault in this well-known retrospective penalties that they impose. And it seems wrong to me that he is one that is paying the penalty for his honesty, his actual honesty, to disclose the scheme. But if he understands that he has to respect, accept some responsibility, then why are HMRC not doing the same? And in the very least, providing for all those affected and offering better settlement terms. Because, and I say this to the Minister, again the parallels with the post office scheme, is that many of the loan charge victims basically aren't being believed. That's one of the reasons. Uh, these were complex tax arrangements in many, many cases. And they were missold to people. They were simply missold to people. Individuals that took these arrangements out were not tax professionals and they just went along with what they were told. <coughs> and then what has happened subsequently, and we've heard cases, they have been crippled financially way beyond any sensible, proportionate rationale. And they need help. They need help. And I agree with other uh, members this afternoon who have said that we have an opportunity to put this right. But at the very least, those individuals could be better supported. Better supported in just three ways. For a start, the loans should be exempt from IHT. And where victims are subject to accelerated payment notices, which occur when HMRC thinks that it detects a tax avoidance scheme, and that disputed tax 
is paid to HMRC, why can there not be proper discretion applied to the circumstances? And I say to the Minister, go back and look at those cases and help those victims. And then finally, we should be scrapping, or at the very least, extending the residual tax waiver. Because that alone has been thoroughly unjust time and time again. Because remember, if you didn't settle before the 30th of September, it meant that HMRC would apply the penal loan charge and they would calculate the settlement given a higher figure. And that, again, has disadvantaged many, many people. So look, just like last week, we took action. And many actually were applauded for taking that decisive action. If there is a willingness, and I think there is a willingness in society if this was exposed to the level that it went on, something should be done and it can be done. And just remember, there are so many people innocently caught up with this. It has huge parallels with the post office scandal and it should be put right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to speak in this debate. Can I thank, first of all, the, the Honourable Members for East Antrim and for Buckingham for, for setting the scene and for getting the debate as well and for bringing this uh, matter to the Chamber. The, the job of this House, Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe, is to act on behalf of our constituents. It's MRC, whatever the, their independence as it may be, it's MRC is a tool of this government uh, and therefore there has to be some accountability. So the accountability of the Chamber today, Madam Deputy Speaker, with great respect, I believe, uh, and the Minister I'm very fond of, uh, the, the, the ball will lie at his feet at the end of this debate uh, and where he kicks it will, will tell us what's going to happen. The loan charge is a controversial tax policy that has affected thousands of employees, freelancers, contractors who were persuaded or in many cases coerced into using loan schemes to reduce the tax bills. The policy introduces a tax-related measure in 2019. It gives the HMRC, uh, the, they can go back to collect taxes back to April 1999. So some have faced that bankruptcy, depression, even committed suicide because of this. So I ask this question to the Minister. How is it possible for HMRC to investigate individuals as far back as 20 years when HMRC's own limit for holding information on taxpayers is seven years only? I, I don't quite get my head around that, that, that issue. How does a person challenge a 20-year-old tax demand and how does HMRC breach GDPR regulations by holding such information uh, for this length of time? The loan charge policy is unjust and unworkable, a retrospective tax that violates the principle of legal certainty and the rule of law. It is a punitive uh, measure that targets innocent taxpayers who acted in good faith and followed professional uh, advice. It has resulted in disastrous consequences for immense hardship or distress and tragedy for thousands of people across the country. While it's a retrospective tax and insidious in its nature because it changes the rules after the game has been played. Imagine winning your game, the football match 3 0, and then they, after the match is over, the guy comes and says, Oh, by the way, you didn't win 3 0, you lost 3 0, and here's how it happened. Uh, that's, what this is, that's what's happened with, it, with this, uh, this law that we have here before us. It ignores the fact that many people who use these schemes did so because they had no choice, they were forced to by their employers or clients to do so. It disregards the fact that many people who use these schemes did not benefit from them, they paid the fees, the interest, and taxes on their loans. And if you seek professional advice, and, you, and we all do that, uh, we do that daily in, our, in the job that we do, uh, and you follow, up the, that follow it up because you believe it's legal and correct, then you expect to be protected. In this case, they haven't been. The loan charge is a retaliatory measure that it imposes disproportionate and unreasonable demands on taxpayers who have already paid their fair share. It calculates the tax liability based on the total amount of the loans, regardless of the actual income or profit derived from them. It adds interest and penalties on top of the tax, inflates the bills to astronomical levels, it denies the right to appeal, to challenge or settle the tax disputes in a fair and independent tribunal. It forces people to pay the tax in one lump sum without regard to their financial, uh, uh, current financial situation or ability to pay. HMRC employs a process that has caused immense hardship and distress for thousands of people across the country. It has pushed people into debt, to poverty and homelessness. It has ruined careers, 
businesses and reputations. It has damaged mental health, well-being and relationships. It has driven people to despair and suicide. According to the Lone Charge Action Group, at least 10 people have taken their lives. And that must, that's a sobering, sobering figure, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, it also says that they've referred 13 further suicide attempts and another 11 cases of serious self-harm. I, I think we need to remember, Madam Deputy, these are not just numbers. These are human lives. These are constituents. These are colleagues. These are friends. These are family members. And how many more lives uh, will be lost before government listens and acts? Uh, this is an immense responsibility on the minister who is here today. But I hope that the, the minister can give us uh, the reassurance on behalf of our constituents this very issue. Perhaps the most striking feature of all this is the brutality of HMRC's ruthless approach. It extends to cruelty. It is no stretch to say people were affected and pursued to the grave and beyond because of bereaved families are ruthlessly pursued by the HMRC for its demands. And HMRC continues to be one that is unyielding and relentless. Uh, HMRC defends its actions by claiming it has a duty to collect tax that is owed, that it offers support and flexibility to those who are struggling. Uh, uh, and Madam Deputy, uh, HMRC also has a duty, I believe, above all else, to be competent to uphold its charter with states that will always act to get things right. HMRC is in breach of its very own charter. And I think the Minister needs to uh, come clean and give us some uh, assurance in relation to that. The loan charity policy has failed on every level, fiscal and human. It has failed to collect the tax that it claims is due. It has failed to uphold the principles of justice and fairness that underpin our tax system. It has failed to protect the rights and interests of taxpayers who have done nothing wrong. It has failed to prevent the harm and suffering that is inflicted on thousands of people. It has failed to, to acknowledge the mistakes and errors that have been made in implementing and enforcing the policy. It has failed to respond effectively to the recommendations and criticisms that have been made by various bodies, including the House of the Lords Economic Affairs Committee, the IPPG on the loan charge and the independent review led by Sir Amos Morse. I conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, in, in uh, uh, adherence to the time scale that was given. The loan charge is a policy that must be abolished. It is not too late for the Minister and for our government to do the right thing. It is not too late Madam Deputy Speaker, to end this injustice, it is not too late to save lives. So I urge the Minister and our government to listen to the voices of reason, of compassion and conscience and to abolish the loan charge once and for all. And the quicker it's done, the better. Thank you. Uh, Vera Hope House. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. What I'm going to say um, now e echoes what has already been said this afternoon, but I really want to add my voices um, to all of um, um, you and my constituents, particularly because there has been, have been Bath constituents affected, and I really want to help them as much as I can now. The loan charge has destroyed lives. Of course, business and individuals should pay their fair share in tax. However, much damage has been done to people who acted in good faith and they have been punished in an entirely inappropriate way while those who were behind these schemes have been got away scot-free. We must defend individual taxpayers even if we think that they might have been ill-advised in the first place, but as we have heard this afternoon already, many were actually forced into these schemes um, and they didn't have a choice. The Morse Review concluded that the loan charge was not an appropriate or fair response to the use of payroll loan arrangements. It focuses on loans made many years ago. They were not taxable under the law as it was understood at the time and HMRC did not act against them. As enacted, the loan charge means that income tax must be paid as if the outstanding amount was part of the income tax in that current tax year. This does not account for changed financial circumstances, which is particularly relevant for freelancers. Those taxpayers pay much more than they would have done if they had paid tax on the loan at the time. The loan charge stated aim is to end tax avoidance schemes, which is understandable. We all want to ensure that people pay their, share, pay their share. However, the central injustice here is the HMRC has only pursued users of the scheme who acted in good faith instead of those who recommended, promoted and operated them. As a result, the loan chart is not even a deterrent. There has never been a conviction for those promoting loan schemes that are now subject to the charge. 
Those people who were compliant and disclosed information on their tax returns have been hit the hardest. Nearly all respondents to the survey by the loan charge APPG reported that they did not have the risk of pay payroll loan arrangement explained to them. Now some face tax bills as high as £400,000. Families have broken down and there have been suicides. People were made to feel like criminals. However, they entered into these arrangements following professional advice and many have said that as contractors they had little or no choice but to enter into those schemes. Many small and medium-sized companies, owners and directors were also impacted after following professional tax advice. Their staff now face redundancies. As well as the awful mental health, health, health impacts, which we also have heard from the um, Honourable Member, tax bills of hundreds of thousands of pounds leave some with no option but to go bankrupt. In many cases, being declared bankrupt will prevent people from working again or paying tax. None of it would have happened if HMRC had identified the issue, a earlier publicised the risk of payroll loan schemes and penalised those behind the schemes. The nightmare now unfolding has echoes to the post office scandal when individuals with absolutely no intent of wrongdoing are left with impossible choices. Livelihoods and lives are being destroyed by those running the schemes well knew what they were up to and are getting away with it. In addition, government bodies are magnifying the injustice, pursuing people with intimidation and, and making them fearful and we should put this right rather than uh, making, it, uh, uh, making this wrong even wronger. We urgently need a genuinely independent review of the whole load in charge and a fair and final resolution for all. It is clear that there is huge cross-party interest. It is in everyone's interest to finally resolve this, not just for those facing overwhelming tax bills, but also for HMRC and the government. The loan charge has not even achieved its intention. Instead, it represents a policy failure that has left thousands suffering. And it is for all of us now to act and act quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Well SNP spokesperson Kirsty Black. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and congratulations to the member for East Andrum for bringing this important debate. And thank you to the Backbench Business Committee for granting it. Um, as the member from Strangford uh, said, and I'll paraphrase a bit, this is an absolute mess. It's not an ethereal mess. It's not some sort of thing that's not happening to real people. This is a mess that is happening to real people and affecting their lives today. Um, <coughs> we, we have a situation where the promoters and uh, the operators have faced no recourse. Tens of thousands of people have had their lives changed, their lives torn apart and HMRC have not been held to account for their behaviour in this. We must get to a point that there is a resolution, that there is an end found to this, that the sword of Damocles is removed um, from people. Starting first on uh, the promoters and the operators, there has been, uh, as has been said, no arrests, no prosecutions, never mind any convictions for anybody who's been promoting or selling the schemes. And if you go back and you look at the debates from that time, the government minister said, we are cracking down on schemes. Yep. They didn't say we are cracking down on the individuals who yep. use those schemes. Exactly. They made very clear that they were cracking down on schemes. They gave commitments to us <laughs> that they were chasing those promoters and chasing the operators. Now, whether ministers were lied to by officials on this, or whether ministers knowingly came and told us um, something that was incorrect, I do not know. However, it should never have happened. We should never have been given those assurances which are patently false. Um, th there has been a consistent and concerted campaign of disinformation around this. MPs on behalf of their constituents, but also MPs on behalf, talking about the general issue, have been faced with disinformation. We have been told stuff that is untrue whenever we have tried to find out information on it. Um, I do agree with uh, the uh, member from East Antrim. We do need to redouble our efforts to go... Uh, not even redouble efforts, because if you double nothing, you still get nothing. <laughs> we need to actually have efforts to go after the promoters. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just the promoters who promoted those schemes back in the day. It's the new ones that are springing up. It's the other individuals and the other organisations that are taking advantage of people who are caught up in the loan charge scandal. There are people that are being offered, you know, there are people that are being told, oh, 
you're involved in the loan charge stuff, I will help you with this. Taking their money and then running for the hills. That is still happening today and these folk are not facing any sanctions. These organisations are not facing sanctions for their behaviour. The government needs to ensure that it is taking action. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, in terms of the, the lives of individuals, it is the case that their lives in so many cases have been irrevocably <coughs> damaged by this. Communication has been terrible. There has been contradictions throughout. Every member here who has talked about individual cases has said that people have been given conflicting information by HMRC. Right? They were told, if you pay this much, it will be fine. And then they were told, actually, we've discovered that we want another 50 grand from you. Or we've discovered that we need this. Or we're going to serve an APN and now, oh, oh, we've reopened tax year 2003. They've been told conflicting information. We're all having that reported to us as constituency MPs. Now, either every one of our constituents that has come to us about these issues is lying to us, or this is actually happening. And I would tend to assume that this is actually happening. People are being mistreated by HMRC in relation to this. And that is a major concern. It's impossible even for MPs to find out how much HMRC think people owe. You know, if we get that settlement, and then there's times that I've had a settlement figure or an amount on behalf of a constituent, and then HMRC have chased that person again later for other money. It is, as I said, a sword of Damocles hanging over people. They cannot ever get to the stage of resolution, because even if they settle, HMRC can come back and say, oh, sorry, we miscalculated. We're, we're going to chase you for another year. There is not a point that people can get out of this trap that they have found themselves in. Now, I've spoken to so many constituents who have, for various reasons, whether it's loan charge or other things, began to get to the stage of being terrified at opening envelopes yeah. that come through the door. Yeah. Now, those of us that are dealing with constituents yeah. who are caught up in this, they are terrified to open any envelope that looks like it might be official because it might be another demand for tens of thousands of pounds. It might be another demand for money that they don't have. Exactly. Now, we <coughs> are absolutely... Sorry. Following uh, the, the Honourable Lady's ar uh, arguments and uh, agree very much with her, does she not agree that it's almost contrary to jurisprudence where there's no double jeopardy. You cannot be tried more than once for the same offence. Yet the HMRC, on those occasions, seem to be doing just that. Yeah, I'm really concerned that we're not going to get to an end for this and our constituents are never going to feel comfortable opening letters again. They're never going to get out of it. I think what the Minister needs to do is to look not just at this issue as a whole, but to look at each of the individual cases. Because it's very clear that there has been a disparity in the way people have been treated. We were given utmost reassurance that nobody would lose their home and nobody would be made bankrupt as a result. That was made utterly clear. I remember standing in Westminster Hall and the minister standing up and making those promises. Now, those promises have dematerialised completely. I'm a constituent on universal credit whose only asset is his home and he's been asked for tens of thousands of pounds. Not tens of thousands of pounds over a 12-year period or over a 20-year period. Tens of thousands of pounds today the only way he could get that money is to sell his house. Now, that is directly opposite what the ministers told us at the time. We need to ensure that these changes are made. And just, just lastly, the resolution point is the most important point for me. Yeah. It needs to end. Yeah, so we yeah. need to get a resolution for individuals yeah, or yeah. a resolution for the whole group. But people need to be absolutely confident that they will never, ever get a terrifying demand through the door from HMRC again about something that they thought had been sorted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There needs to be a proper resolution for each of these individuals. And then we'll be doing our jobs as constituency MPs, having reached a resolution for our individual constituents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Shadow Chief Secretary Darren Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I start by congratulating the honourable members for East Antrim, uh, alongside Hemel Hempstead, Motherwell and Wishall, with whom I've worked for many years on the Post Office Horizon scandal, and Buckingham uh, for securing this important debate today and for the Backbench Business Committee for granting the time. Uh, I also pay tribute to the members of the Loan Charge All Party Parliamentary Group and other Right Honourable and Honourable members here today, alongside the journalists who have investigated this issue so doggedly, uh, including the Yorkshire Post. 
One of my core political beliefs is that when one person has power over another, that they must be subject to effective checks and balances. This is a crucial part of our democratic system and at the heart of the freedoms that we should all enjoy in a democracy such as ours. In my roles as a lawyer, a trade unionist, a member of parliament, the chair of a parliamentary committee and now a member of the shadow cabinet, I have always contributed to ensuring that delicate balance of power is tilted towards the citizen and away from the powerful and that unchecked power is challenged and brought into line. On this issue today, Madam Deputy Speaker, I recommit myself to that cause. And that's why we in the Labour Party believe a key principle of our tax system is that the government should treat everybody fairly. It is why we support attempts, of course, to tackle tax avoidance schemes, including disguised remuneration schemes. However, HMRC's approach to the loan charge, which has affected tens of thousands of people to date, means that the government has failed in ensuring that duty of fairness. As we have heard, ordinary people who are victims of mis-selling are facing financial ruin and personal harm because of the way in which HMRC has pursued the loan charge. And that tragically, at least 10 people affected by HMRC's behaviour are known to have taken their own lives. The House should pause and reflect on that fact. Ten people who were in such a state of despair. <coughs> Ten people not only with the thought of ending their own lives, but with the will to do so. Ten families now grieving for the loss of a loved one, all because of an administrative approach to tax collection. Madam Deputy Speaker, it could therefore not be clearer that the government's approach is not working. Ministers, including the Prime Minister when Chancellor, routinely refer to the 2019 Morse Review and assert that there is nothing else to do. That review cannot and must not be the final word on the matter or be a roadblock to getting a fairer solution for people who have been victims of bad professional advice and mis-selling. While people in everyday jobs, from NHS workers to social workers, are being pursued by HMRC, and some taxpayers are being told they owe hundreds of thousands of pounds, the government, as we've heard repeatedly today, is doing little to pursue the actual promoters behind mis-selling schemes. Incredibly, HMRC have been issuing fewer than two fines a year against the architects and enablers of failed tax avoidance schemes. How can the government possibly justify such a light-touch approach for the promoters of such schemes, while many of those people caught up in them suffer such serious harm. Over the course of this parliament, the Labour Party has repeatedly called on the government to find a fair and effective way forward on the impact of the loan charge. There is no disagreement that such schemes are illegitimate and damaging. However, there have now been, has there not, sufficient cases and testimonies to raise alarm bells in the heads of ministers about the nature of the current approach. In June 2020, during consideration of the Finance Bill, members debated a new clause which would have forced the government to review the impact of the loan charge scheme, including the fairness with which HMRC has implemented the policy. Unfortunately, the government dismissed the proposal, claiming the Morse review went far enough. Again, in December 2021, my colleague, the Honourable Member for Ealing North, tabled a new clause to Finance Number 2 Bill. It would have required the Chancellor to commission an independent review to consider HMRC's approach to the loan charge scheme and re make recommendations on how it should be altered. This review would have required the government to explain to this House what efforts it had taken to guarantee the review's independence and that once the review had made recommendations, whether the government agreed with them or not, and if so, how effective it was in implementing them on a six-monthly basis. Such a review could have finally offered a way forward. We on this side of the House voted in favour of that new clause <coughs> and the review it proposed in December 2021, but sadly it was defeated by the government. <coughs> Treasury ministers must have realised that this issue is not going away. Two years on from that vote, it is still clear that the government's approach to the loan charge means that ordinary people who are victims of mis-selling are suffering financial ruin and personal harm. Ministers and members across the House have heard the harrowing accounts of people whose lives have been ruined. This cannot be what the government envisaged in the first place, and it must not be allowed to continue. So will the Treasury use this moment today to finally agree to commission 
a further truly independent review. Such a review could consider the approach of HMRC towards the ordinary people caught up in the loan charge schemes and further consider what action should be taken against the architects and promoters of these schemes. This will be in the interest of restoring fairness in our tax system. It could provide a way forward for the many thousands of people caught up in the loan charge and it should end the devastating consequences suffered by the people involved to date. That is all that we are asking for, an independent review, albeit one, as honourable members have said, should be conducted quickly. And finally, can I urge the Minister to answer the specific question put to him today, whether HMRC officials are being awarded bonus payments for the recovery of loan charge monies. I urge the Government to learn the lessons from other scandals, stop burying their heads in the sand, for the Minister to be brave and to do the right thing. Financial Secretary Nigel Huddleston. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the uh, Honourable Member for East Antrim and Buckingham and others for securing the debate and for all the contributions we've had from members across the House today. I'd just like to, uh, to name them all because I think it's important we get on record uh, all those who have contributed, including the Honourable and Right Honourable Members uh, from Murford Tidville, Chingford and Wood Green, Cheshire and Amersham, New Forest West, uh, Kirkcaldy, North East Somerset, Arfon, uh, Halton Price and Howden, Hayes and Harlington, Strangford, North Lo North. North Norfolk, Bath and indeed others uh, who have contributed to the debate today because um, there is no doubt we've heard today the strength of feeling on this issue and of course I stand at the dispatch box not only as a Minister, Financial Secretary to the Treasury but also as a constituency MP who has also had representations on these issues from my own constituents on these matters. The loan charge alongside the wider issue of the use of disguised remuneration schemes um, is a complex subject that is deeply impactful for many of our constituents. And I can assure our honourable members that the government takes this issue incredibly seriously and recognises the impact that the loan charge has had. And I'll endeavour to address the points that have been raised today, but also wish to reassure colleagues that many of the questions that they have been asking today about disguised re remuneration, government policy, the loan charge, the approach and tone taken by HMRC are precisely the questions that I have myself been asking the officials for the very reasons that they have outlined. And I do hope that during the course of my response I can provide some additional reassurance today, because in particular, in, in the light of recent circumstances, I I want to make sure that I am making the right decisions and asking the right questions. Tax authorities, tax ministers are never popular. It's the nature of the work. But I do want to make sure that we act in a way that is reassuring and correct and fair to all taxpayers, and I take that duty and responsibility very seriously. So, for example, I have had discussions and conversations uh, with Jim Harrod, the Chief Exec of HMRC, for example, on the very issue in the light of the Post Office about are there commissions or perverse incentives on people that may lead to distorting behaviour, and I have been reassured that they have not. Therefore, this debate is very useful, and these conversations are very useful because they enable me also to ask the right questions of my officials. I will not be able to give everybody the answers they want today. I am going to disappoint some people with this response because I believe that we have taken the right approach. There are certain areas where I will continue to ask questions, um, but I am aware that I will not be able to satisfy everybody today, but that will never stop me from continuing to ask the right questions. Now, briefly by way of context, because not everybody who's listening to uh, this uh, may be aware, of course the purpose of the loan charge was to ensure users of disguised remuneration schemes uh, pay their fair share of income tax and national insurance contributions. And disguised remuneration schemes are contrived tax avoidance arrangements that seek to avoid income tax and national insurance on income by disguising them as some of a type of payment, typically in the form of a loan that is wrongly alleged to be non-taxable. And be in no doubt, and as it has been recognised today uh, across the House, these schemes do cost the Exchequer, other taxpayers, hundreds of millions of pounds a year. Indeed, the total burden is to the tune of billions of pounds. And it is therefore right that when we identify these completely inappropriate schemes, that we take action. From the earliest days of these schemes, HMRC opened thousands of inquiries into their use and challenged their operation through the courts. 
In 2017, the Supreme Court agreed that these schemes did not work and have never worked to legitimately avoid tax. So tax is due on these payments. But also, as discussed today, and I've heard very clearly, many questions have been raised about how we recover that tax due and who has paid it. In 2022, the Court of Appeal ruled that even where other parties may have obligations to withhold tax under PAYE, the liability for income tax is always that of the individual, fully endorsing a long-standing position of HMRC and, indeed, governments of all colours. In fact, this is a key point. The individual is ultimately primarily responsible for the tax uh, that they own and their own tax affairs. Yep. Will, does he not recognise that quite a lot of people who use the schemes, who were made contractors against their will, are often individuals, just single people, who are not tax experts, who paid the tax as they had to be were asked to pay at the time, and, and did not think that anything was wrong after years later when suddenly HMRC came to pursue them? Does he not recognise that he is doing the wrong thing to those people who really didn't know better? Again, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for the comment there, and I understand completely uh, where she's coming from, but there's multiple points there. As I said, these schemes were never legitimate. They were always tax avoidance, and therefore uh, there was always a clear path, uh, and I'll come on to some of this in a moment, that, that tax was owed. With respect to then who pays, I'll mention this in a moment, but this underlying principle that individuals do also still have personal responsibility to check their tax affairs is an underlying principle that if we start to move away, is very, very difficult to move back from. The point she raises, and further government action, I'll come on to this in a moment as well, because there are some people who are being deceived um, uh, and, and, and actually made to, and forced into errors that are completely inappropriate. So whereas in the early stages of some of these loan schemes, it was the very wealthy people, it was people who I think we can all agree knew exactly what they were doing, um, but others, as the schemes evolved, as the schemes got more sophisticated, as more people were drawn into them, there is a longer tale of people who were acting in good faith, and I think those are many of the cases we've heard today. Um, it's still important that we keep this principle, though, that the ultimate responsibility lies with those individuals, but the way we're going about making sure that tax affairs are straightened is, is really important, that we make sure we do the right thing. I'll give away to the uh, Honourable Gentleman for uh, Strangford. And, um, yeah. so for that, Mr. Fuller, to that point that the Honourable Lady has referred to, I, I think one of the questions that certainly I had in, in my mind was those people who uh, were brought into this scheme unknowingly through their employers uh, and, and found themselves in with a financial burden uh, which they were not aware of. Uh, I, I'm minded of the, of the post uh, office horizon scheme where the, the terminology used in the TB was the little people. The, these with great respect are the little people, people who accept the, the, the systems that are put down before them. Minister, there has to be a way, there has to be a way where we can help them. I, I, I understand where the Honourable Gentleman is coming from, and I'll take a couple of more interventions, but I fear that by doing so, colleagues will be asking the very things I'm about to come on to, so I may resist some of this in the moment. I'll take a couple of more interventions in the moment, but let me say as well to the Honourable Gentleman, I understand completely there uh, the point about the going after the employers who've, who've been deceptive. The loan charge ensures that tax is paid in respect of individuals who entered into the schemes and received payments with no tax deducted. But where possible, HMR seek, uh, do seek and have been seeking uh, that tax from the employer in the first instance. And I'd like to reassure um, honourable members that 80% of revenue collected to date has come from employers. So we are targeting the employers, as, uh, as he rightly uh, pointed out. I'll give way to the right honourable gentleman. Um, and he refers to the 2017 Supreme Court judgment, which, as I understand it, decided that um, the use of an employee benefit trust, the tax fell unequivocally on the employer, and that therefore using the 2017 case doesn't necessarily support him in the way he may think. Yeah. I, th I think there's been um, some debate and disagreement on that, and I think it particularly relates to Section 44 and, and, and so on. HMRC have outlined the policy uh, stance on this. I understand there is disagreement, but, uh, but the, the, uh, the line is, is quite clear at the moment. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman, and then I will make some progress. Yeah. 
a given way. And I agree with him that uh, there is a responsibility on all individuals to make sure that our tax affairs are in order and the correct tax is paid. But what will he tell the Chamber about the responsibility that falls on HMRC to make the public aware and publicise the fact that certain schemes may be seen as tax evasion and therefore not qualify for tax relief? Again, a, a really important point, and I will come on to those in a moment. So I'll just make some more progress before I take some more interventions, because I said I fear I may be um, um, uh, ruining, uh, ruining the responses. Um, as I said earlier on, the way that we recover uh, tax owed um, is important, including the interactions that uh, individuals have with key bodies, including HMRC. And the government recognises that there were areas where the impact of the original loan charge was disproportionate to its aims. We have listened to concerns raised by honourable members in the years since the loan charge was announced, and I have had conversations myself with HMRC about how they have endeavoured, for example, to improve the tone of communication with impacted individuals. Changes in approach were also made following Lord Morse's uh, review, and I've heard many comments about Lord Morse's review today. Um, again, uh, many people may not be aware of it, but in September 2019, the Government asked the former Comptroller and Auditor General of the National Audit Office, Lord Morse, to lead an independent review of the loan charge policy and its implementation. Lord Moores had full discretion over how the review was run, whom he consulted, and the recommendations made. And, of course, that consultation includes the APPG and many people in this room today. Uh, following this review, Lord Moores recommended notable changes to the policy, and the Government accepted 19 out of 20 of his recommendations. These changes benefited about 30,000 people and meant that the loan charge would only apply to outstanding loans made on or after the 9th of December 2010 rather than April 1999. And this was the date that the Government announced anti-avoidance legislation that put beyond all doubt that these schemes were taxable, so a very important date. The loan charge would also not apply to outstanding loans made in any tax years before the 6th of April 2016, where a reasonable disclosure of the use of a tax avoidance scheme was made to HMRC, but HMRC did not take action. Again, a point that some have made today. So taxpayers were also, though, given additional flexibility over the way they pay in line with their individual circumstance. But Lord Morse was clear that the loan charge was necessary, it was in the public interest, and should remain in force. Now, many. Sure. Yeah. Not some of the review, but would he accept that, first of all, uh, HMRC officials helped to service it? They restricted the grounds and the parameters of the review. The review, the original copy of the review, um, uh, has not been disclosed, and we don't know how it was changed in the meantime. There's great doubts about whether or not the Morse review was ever an independent review mm -hmm. and ever came to conclusions that would have dealt with the issues and the unfairness which we've been discussing today. Well, before Mr. replies, I do want to say that I have a, uh, given the Minister more time than would normally be allocated on a backbench debate. And I know that the, the several colleagues have tried to intervene, um, but do be aware that we have another important debate to follow and I'm sure the Minister will be cognizant of that. Minister. Yeah, I, thank, I, thank, uh, I thank you um, uh, Deputy, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker for that guidance and I will try and proceed through the, um, the comments because there's a few more points I'm really uh, keen to make. Um, with regard to the Morse review, uh, it stands up uh, in terms of normal process for such reviews in terms of secretariat and support being provided by uh, government departments from that point. As I said, I, I've heard the comments made to, today. Uh, I don't believe uh, a case uh, has been made uh, for another review. Um, I stand ready always to listen, uh, but that review, I think, stood up uh, quite well, and I don't think anybody's impugning the integrity of Lord Morse today. Um, but, uh, but the review was thorough, significant, and the changes, uh, 19 out of the changes, were implemented. So it was a hugely impactful review, and it was a very thorough review. Now, many honourable members have also um, raised points about tackling promoters, and some individuals facing the loan charge rightly feel aggrieved at the promoters and enablers who facilitated the use of these schemes. Promoters of tax avoidance scheme are parasites on the tax system, let's be in no doubt about that. They cause untold misery to the people they tempt into using these schemes, which almost never deliver the tax savings that were promised. 
The Government has prioritised tackling promoters of tax avoidance schemes and has given HMRC additional powers to do so, as a result of which many promoters have stopped promoting these types of schemes. One individual involved in the promotion of schemes subject to the loan charge has already been convicted and others, other individuals are currently under criminal investigation for low charge linked offences. The Government's also introduced powers through the Finance Acts in 2021 and 22 that allow HMRC to take action more quickly against promoters, and this includes powers that allow HMRC to publish details of promoters of tax avoidance schemes and others involved in the implementation of such schemes. Uh, in 2022, for example, HMRC issued a penalty of a million pounds to a promoter of disguised remuneration schemes and provisions included in the finance bill currently progressing through this house will make it a criminal offence to promote tax avoidance scheme after HMRC has issued a stop notice under the promoters of tax avoidance schemes rules and I'm very pleased to say that those measures are receiving support from all parties. In addition to this, the Government consulted last summer on measures to address non-compliance in the umbrella company market, again uh, a market that many have commented on today. And this includes tackling types of schemes that we have uh, discussed. Um, that discussion, uh, we will be responding to that consultation in due course, but I uh, can uh, let honourable members know that uh, I and uh, um, the fellow minister uh, the, the, for small business at the Department for Business and Trade, we are in discussions already uh, about what the next steps should be there. Um, in the meantime, HMRC will continue to use its full range of civil and criminal powers to disrupt the operations of promoters. Um, very... <coughs> Very briefly, for the last time. Yeah. I, I really am getting anxious that um, the Minister... Um, it, it, we do need to move on very quickly. And Neil Hanvey, if you can be... Which is one of the, the key problems that we have are the inflationary costs that are added to the loan charges. And will he uh, at least uh, uh, commit to look at those inflationary costs that are added on to the taxable sums? He'll be aware that I can't preempt the conclusions of a consultation or what would we respond to, but I hear his, um, his points. Um, many members today, and this is a very important point, have raised the personal and emotional impact of the loan charge on their constituents, and this is something that I, the Government, and HMRC do take very seriously. We recognise the distress that loan scheme users may feel when faced with large bills on their, tax, uh, on their earnings, often many years after the event that the scheme promoters wrongly told them that they would be able to avoid. And we are aware that some people who have faced the loan charge have very sadly taken their own lives or harmed themselves. Um, now, HMRC has made 10 referrals to the Independent Office for Police Conduct where a person has taken, taken their own life. And following referral, HMRC has conducted internal investigations. Nine of the ten investigations have concluded. And although no misconduct was found, HMRC is taking forward organisational learning from these matters to further strengthen the support provided in identifying individuals who need extra help. And I completely understand the points raised by honourable members, and indeed that I have myself heard from individuals impacted by loan charge about the emotional distress. And also, also colleagues have commented about the nature and tone of interaction with HMRC in the past. Again, I've raised this with HMRC officials. Um, and will continue uh, to make these points so that we adopt a more understanding tone. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, there were some other points uh, of clarification raised by honourable members today. I will endeavour to write to them because there are a few factual inaccuracies. For example, there is an appeals process. It's very important uh, to make that point. And also, this is not an area where criminal convictions are acted against uh, the individuals. Uh, so I will write to a few honourable members because it's very, very important that we... Uh, that, that, that there's a lot, of, a lot to debate in this area, but we do need to make sure that we don't scare people and make it clear that there there are appeals processes, and of course there's no cost for that appeals process, for example, and there are other matters that I would like to make them aware of. Therefore, Madam Deputy Speaker, I say I'm aware of the timing. Thank you very much for your patience on what is obviously a very emotive matter today. For those, um, Member, finally an appeal, for those who still have disguised remuneration or loan charge 
liabilities, I would encourage them to engage with HMRC because thousands of people are still not engaging with HMRC and therefore are not able to seek clarity or the support and guidance that is available, including emotional support, work from the Samaritans and other measures that HMRC have in place to help identify and support vulnerable individuals. So I repeat my thanks to honourable members for their engagement today and welcome the continued engagement, including with the APPG and all MPs who have raised this topic with me on behalf of their constituents. Thank you. Sammy Wilson, uh, one minute to wind up. Thank you, Madam Minister. And, and since the uh, time is short, I'm not going to go through all of the speeches we made. Just to thank members for taking part today, for the powerful speeches which they made, and for the two points which I have taken away from this. And the first is this the frustration, fear, and powerlessness which many of our constituents feel yeah. in the face of oppressive government bureaucracy and the pursuit of the, 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 those individuals by people who are not and cannot currently properly be held to account. Yeah, yeah. And the second thing, and I, I repeat what the member for Hazen Hardington said, I hope that the Minister will not, in four year, will not be sitting here in four years' time finding we've had this debate, <coughs> we've had platitudes from the Minister and we have no action. No. I do not want to take part in a similar debate that we have been taking uh, part in today. I think that it's the duty of the Minister, it's the duty of Parliament to hold those who have this power to account and to make sure that it con does not continue to be abused. Hear, hear. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the <coughs> ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order. We now come to the debate on 